Ah, so we have many different people today. <clears throat> Some from <laughs> Bhutan, India, Turkey, America. Good. So I've pinned you, Kati, and I'm going to um, follow you when you, because German seems to be a wee bit slower. So we'll do it that way. Okay, thank you. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, some time to look at the two truths, which is a, an important uh, concept in Mahayana Buddhism. In the uh, original teachings from the Buddha, there's a, an emphasis on going to the other side which was seen as nirvana, something very different and with uh, no real contact with samsara. It's a, an either or structure. But in the Mahayana Buddhism, with the development of the understanding of emptiness, there is more sense that you can have both and you can have samsara and nirvana that all the forms of samsara, everything we are familiar with, everything that seems to be solid and real or to limit us is in fact inseparable from emptiness. James, could you put your camera a bit more? Um... So with, <clears throat> with this understanding, we have relative truth which is where we find ourselves uh, focused on phenomena. Phenomena is here simply means whatever we experience, whether it's uh, our thoughts, our feelings, our body, or everything around us. This is our sphere of operation. And we move in it as a subject in relation to objects and to other subjects in which we have our own separate being. Generally, uh, it seems clear to us that we exist. Our existence is confirmed by the people around us. As we all subscribe to the basic contract that I will take you to be real if you take me to be real. And due to this, we find ourselves as a, a kind of separate entity, a thing in a world of things. Not only uh, do we experience things, but we uh, respond to them with uh, energy, with emotion, with uh, bias. There are things we like, people we like, things we don't like, people we don't like. Generally, we experience this on the basis of being sure that the people we like uh, have good qualities. They are the good qualities inherent in them. And the people we don't like have uh, negative qualities, uh, threatening qualities, which we take to be inherent in them. And because we all want happiness, our tendency is to seek more of the good, that is what makes us happy, and avoid the bad, that is what makes us unhappy. When we look around, we can see that this is the, the framework within which everything is operating. Our politics, economics, uh, choices of clothing, cinema, and so on. And now, in this period of uh, individualization, in which each of us is attentive to the specificity of our own situation, we make choices which confirm our sense of who we are. And this is supported by the development of the uh, capitalist uh, and even Chinese communist exchange economy, the production of commodities. So we, we define ourselves through the choices we make. Selectivity and the possibility of doing that, given the 
range of commodities available to us is uh, confirming of the uniqueness of our own ego self. Some, <clears throat> sometimes having such a wide range of options can feel uh, exciting and life affirming. And sometimes it can feel just overwhelming. There's so many choices available. So this uh, complex world of discrete entities, each carrying a valency which we attribute to them, but which we take to be innate in them, is the basic structure of our ordinary world. Now, in this text by Patu Rinpoche, he describes this uh, structure as impure relative truth. In pure relative truth, there are phenomena, but they are not invested with our own particular egoic uh, attitudes and beliefs. But it's difficult to get to that pure relative truth. Because for each of us, there is somehow this sense that um, my opinions, my choices express a basic truth about me. So, as usual, when we study Dharma, we are faced with an inquiry into the nature of identity. In the general Theravadan teachings, the Buddha said that there is no true existence or inherent existence in people. That our sense of being a person is a generated by the interaction of the five skandhas or the five factors of that constitute the sense of being a person. So, oh, as we have looked uh, many times before, we have uh, form, which is shape and color, sensation, feeling, which is positive, neutral, or negative. Then we have perception, whereby we uh, experience ourselves seeing things, hearing things, smelling things, tasting things. So this uh, perception is already infused with the feeling tone of reification, of solidification of uh, what is encountered through the senses. Then we have the uh, factors of compounding or uh, thickening, whereby different associations are joined into the perception to give it a, a sense of density. So in this uh, setting, our memories, our knowledge, uh, everything which is, as it were, uh, our background potential for being ourselves is available to be wrapped around a particular perception. And then the fifth factor is consciousness the sense that we are conscious of something. <clears throat> Consciousness refers to the mental uh, function or activity of uh, engaging with an object. The object could be, could be taken to be something which is outside ourselves, houses, trees, and so on. It could be a memory that you're thinking about or a plan you're making for what you'll do next week. But it becomes something you can think about. It could be something uh, that you never or directly encounter, which is abstract, like uh, God, for example. But by uh, approaching <clears throat> the unexperienced, as if it was an object that could be experienced, it is as if we can talk about it in a rational way. Now, in the Buddha's formulation, these five skandhas or heaps uh, are placed together and form a, the pattern of ourselves. 
just as if you are building a house, you have the bricks and the beams and the tiles for the roof and so on. And when they are all placed together <clears throat> in the recognizable pattern, we say, oh, this is a house. When we look at the house, what we see is bricks and window frames and doors and tiles. But we are not in the habit, unless we are architects, of analyzing uh, the construction. It's a house. There seems to be a givenness to it. It just is. And that's what the, the Buddha is saying about our sense of being someone. That, that we are, oh, sorry, on you go. That we are a composite, we are compounded, we are put together from the operation of many different factors. And yet, in their functioning, they, there seems to be just one thing. So if I say, well, this is me, and I describe the different factors of me, my body, my interests, and so on, it's as if I'm here, this sense of myself is here and primary, and yeah, I have this body which has changed over the years. So that the, this felt sense of myself seems to be an enduring fact. I exist. So you might sadly uh, experience after an earthquake, my house has fallen down. Maybe the walls are still standing, but the roof has fallen in. My house will need to be repaired. We're investing into this wreckage the notion that somehow there is an essential my houseness to it. So when we uh, look at this from the Buddhist point of view, we see that the ego self, my sense of self, is generated by the operation together of these five factors. My myself is secondary. It is uh, something generated or created or manifesting from the operation of the five factors. My, this felt sense of myself is not intrinsic, but is extrinsic. It's uh, something which is arising from the process, not, it's not the ground of the process. This is very radical. It's uh, upsetting. If we look with this lens, and we see, oh, yes, maybe it is like this, then many of the assumptions we operate on the basis of are false. So when we're looking uh, from this point of view, uh, we also uh, consider impermanence. <clears throat> many of the factors which we take as uh, inherent in us, as belonging to us, have been developed in interaction with the world. The baby learns to speak a, a language by interaction with people who already speak that language. If children are not exposed to people uh, speaking and especially speaking with them in a simple, comprehensive way, comprehensible way, then they can find learning language very difficult later on. But very often if you're <clears throat> talking with a four or five year old child, they are like an ocean of words just streaming out of them, stories and observations about everything. Once we come into language, we tend to uh, be unable to retrieve memories of how it was before we were in language. That is to say, that which has been learned 
and internalized and ripened in interaction with our potential is taken to be something which is just belonging to me. So the more we analyze the changes that have occurred to these factors during our lifetime, we see that they are uh, unstable and situationally developed. So there is a strange paradox here. That is to say, <clears throat> seeing the interactive nature of the field factors or elements in self, in, in our embodiment rather, and in the environment, we, uh, we develop this sense of self. Then if I say, uh, I am not who I think I am, that seems accurate. Because however I think about myself or speak about myself, is only a very small articulation of the many factors which uh, give rise to this uh, moment of uh, exist felt existence. And yet, at the same time, I am who I think I am. Because it is precisely my thoughts about who I am that become the kind of container and glue to bring together the factors which generate my ever-changing sense of self and take it to be enduring. So this second aspect is indicating <clears throat> that our sense of self is generated by the interpretive matrix we operate in. So this uh, matrix or patterning of interpretation arises from the, the language that we enter into, the culture we enter into, whether we are deemed to be male or female, whether we are healthy or sick, whether we are rich or poor. Uh, these many, many factors which are not in the palm of our hand, feed into how we are able to think about who we are. So although we have a general statement like the United Nations Charter of Human Rights, we tend to find ourselves operating inside uh, fields of assumption and belief which uh, give us very specific limitations to how we can express ourselves uh, living <clears throat> excuse me living as a man in london for me it is inconceivable that uh, the police would suddenly drive up next to me in the street and arrest me for not wearing a scarf over my head but clearly this happens for women in iran there is no uh, flat earth, there is no evenness. We are in a very bumpy world of cultural interpretations. From the Dharma point of view, these varieties in cultural orientation, family orientation, and the factors of our own personality all arise uh, for us as experiences ripening from past activity, what we call karma. So this is a further way of seeing the world as relational or relative. So when I look outside, I'm not seeing uh, things which just exist by themselves. From a general point of view, I can see that the houses have been built and some are better kept than others. I can see that the leaves on the trees are changing color since it's now entering the season of autumn. That's uh, an interpretation of the, these phenomena existing as objects. But if we look through the lens of karma, what is revealed to me, what is the field of my experience 
is the revelation of the ripening of the consequences of my previous activity. We don't just have uh, different opinions of, uh, I don't know, preferring apples to pears on the basis of, well, this is how, who I am. It's that the potential of the environment, which is a, a kind of energetic resonance, vibrates with me according to my karmic resonance, and I find myself drawn towards certain factors and not towards others. And this, again, is a very radical and, and troubling idea. It, it carries with it uh, a critique of the idea of being an autonomous ego self. I may say, I am what I am, and I'm going to live life on my terms. But what is revealed to me as possible will be different from what is revealed to the people living in the next flat. Not only is, it, is this saying that the world manifests on the basis of ethics, but it is not some neutral object formation. You live in your world. I live in my world. Of course, there are correspondences. We can, because we live in language, we can exchange comments about things. But these things that we talk about are concepts. The actual thing or phenomena or appearance as it comes to us is inexpressible if i decide i'm going to eat a banana i have a concept of banananess i have a experience of bananas i have learned not to eat the skin of the banana but I have learned to eat the skin of apples. So the banana as a, an idea, as an interpretation, is something which I can have knowledge of and I can exchange that knowledge with someone else. But now I <clears throat> lift the banana and start to smell it. What is that? Oh, I say, oh, it's quite sweet. I might say it's like something else, or it reminds me of that other fruit. I put it in my mouth. There is texture, taste, because the uh, structure of the banana is not rigid, it starts to dissolve in my mouth. And so my tongue is moving the pieces of banana around quite easily. I'm talking about what happens but the actual taste of the banana how is it again i can only say it's like something else if i can observe that i what i can see is i am using language to reassure myself that my ego structure is powerful that is to say, with my dualistic consciousness, I can think and talk about this thing that I take to be a banana. But what is the thingness of the banana? It's a concept. The taste is inexpressible. But I am able to talk about the taste. That is to say, I project certain formations or parameters onto the taste arising in my mouth and applying the functions of comparing and contrasting. I relate what is arising to something else that I have experienced. This what that is arising is already 
a melange of emergent experience and conceptualization. That is to say, I am a colonialist. The ego is colonizing the world of direct experience and pulling things into its own framework of meaning making. Rather than simply giving myself to this mysterious, uncatchable taste, I, I, I conceptualize an interpretation. And this process confirms and uh, intensifies the dualistic structure of I am tasting something. So then if I describe this to someone else, it would be quite uh, usual for them to say, well, James, do you like that banana? Because liking and not liking is the second of these skanda heaps and it's a primary method of establishing our relationship with what we take to be the things of the world. If I like it, I decide to go back to the same shop and buy more bananas. And if I don't like it, I think, oh, not for me, I'll, I'll get another fruit instead. What I'm doing there is making a decision on the basis of my idea of my experience, the narrative I can generate on the basis of my idea of that experience. So what I have just described is the fact that we are living in a mental world. We think we are in direct contact with what is outside. That uh, our experience can be raw and fresh. So I went out of my door early this morning and it had been raining and I think, oh, the air is so fresh, but a bit damp. And it's just as I said, I think the air is fresh and a bit damp. My narrative about the day is based on the concepts I apply to the day. So from the Dharma point of view, this is very important. I'm not in touch with how it is in itself. My frame of reference is how it is for me. And this installs the ego self in the center. In the tantric tradition, the, the main deity is in the center of the mandala. In our egoic world, each of us sits like a little god in the center of our world, having many different opinions. What we suffer from here is what's called the, the first of the five poisons. Uh, obscurity or opacity or mental dullness or stupidity. This is uh, samsara according to the rules of Scottish cooking. When I was a child, everything was cooked. I would never have imagined you could eat a carrot raw or a piece of kohlrabi. Salad was something unpleasant one had to endure in the summer. Everything is cooked. That is what food means. So, in the same way, in terms of the dualistic ego self, everything is cooked with concepts. We think we're tasting the thing itself but the spices have already been massaged in. Everything is cooked in the microwave of reification. Very quick. And that taste that we have, the taste that confirms that I know what is happening, is an artificial taste. The word for a uh, relative uh, truth, or the, the word that is kunzop. Kunzop indicates uh, false, unreliable, erroneous. It indicates 
sorry, it indicates a fiction, which is something which is created and is believable as if it were not created. So if you read a, a well-constructed uh, novel, you believe in the characters. These characters cannot be found in any country, but they are found in the imaginable, in the imagined country of the book. We enter into that world. And it, if it, the construction is good, it rings true. That is, that is to say, the characters in the novel exhibit qualities and behaviors which may be a bit surprising or interesting, but somehow are believable. And this basic principle can be expanded to science fiction, where radically unusual environments and creatures are depicted in a way which permits us to believe in them. We are very fortunate creatures because our culture encourages deception. We can go to the cinema, to the theater. We can read novels, poems, plays. I enjoy being deceived. Well, I wouldn't call it being deceived. It's just, um, it's an entertainment. An entertainment in English is something you hold. You, you offer it hospitality. We offer hospitality to the imagined. So relative truth indicates something which is imagined, yet believed to be true and indeed to be real. In the theater, we see a play which has been written by the playwright and rehearsed by the actors. In the theater of our life, the play has been written by our own karma and is enacted by all the beings that we encounter, including ourselves. We believe in our life. I exist. This is me. It's a given. It just is. Then we look at other people's lives. Why would they want to live like that? How can they bear to do what they do? Simply because they are not me. What seems to be objectively true and real is simply uh, a hyper-energized opinion that I hold. What is important for me is not important for many other people in this world. This again gives us the flavor or a chance to see, oh, this world is my mind. Other people are manifesting the drama of their own existence, just as I manifest the drama of mine. When we look clearly at how it is occurring, we see that nothing is truly existing. And yet we can't say it's non-existing because it's impactful. We, we are affected by what occurs. Our life is the middle way, neither existing nor non-existing, but a ceaseless flow of imaginings. We live in the realm of it is as if. But it's very difficult for us to see this directly because we imagine that the imagined is real. In the world, many wars are going on at the moment. There are many crises from climate change. And there are famines in many, many places. These events emerge due to uh, the balance of the five elements and uh, or the imbalance of the five elements and the imbalance of the five poisons. Our mental dullness manifests as the confusion that the unreal is real or the imagined is self-existing. 
in English, the word real carries the sense of something which exists in itself. If it's uh, real, its existence is not in doubt. It is. And yet, from this Dharma point of view, is saying, no, 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 no. The, what you take to be as is, it is, is it is as if. <clears throat> now, this is very important because it's saying nothing is established in itself. Or rather, whether anything is established in itself or not, you do not know. What you have access to is experience. There are two possibilities of experience. One is as is. That is the taste of the banana before I tell the banana what it tastes like. The second is as it is as if, which is my interpretation of how the banana is. So, samsara, this uh, domain of impermanence and uh, suffering, fantasies of uh, real existence which are misleading. Sorry, this is the domain of as if. But because we think it is as is, there are two consequences. Firstly, we can't recognize that it is as if. And secondly, this uh, false belief hides from us the actual presence of the as is. So what I'm referring to here as the as is, is in this text called the absolute truth. Absolute here means it's not relative, it's not conditioned, it's not standing in relation to anything else, it just is. It, it's not contrived, it's not invented, it's not made. It's present from the very beginning. It is the uncreated, the unborn. It hasn't come into existence as something. And so it doesn't stand in relation to any other thing. Now, we have to remember what we've just been looking at is that all that we take to be things are in fact imagined. And you can imagine the absolute truth. You can stick your concepts onto anything. If you first conceptualize the thing you're sticking your concept onto. Okay, if 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 you first if you first conceptualize what you are going to stick the thing onto as being a thing, now you're just playing a game of imagining. Whatever we say about the absolute is false. So from the point of view of wisdom we could end our little weekend session here. Because talking about it is not going to bring us to the absolute. And yet, because we are stitched into this constructed world, it can be useful from the perspective of compassion or kindness to understand the nature of stitching. How is it that I find myself in this complexity? When I try to think my way out of it, I just get a headache, it's impossible. Therefore, I have to find another way. On the relative level, I can see how this knotting, how this enmeshment has occurred. This is all the Dharma paths from the Theravadan right up to Tantra. Or we can also see directly the nature of the Absolute. 
for example, when I was in primary school, aged seven or eight, we had to do knitting. And I would be knitting and knitting with white wool, which was becoming not very white due to my dirty hands. And somehow it became a knotted ball, which I tried to pull my way out of. So in the end, I had to take it home and with many tears, to give it to my mother to say, I don't know what to do. And she said, well, you just have to look, find the, find the piece of wool that's outside the ball and see where it's going. And I would say, but I hate it. I don't want to look at it. So that's a good way of getting further into samsara. But of course, slowly untangling a ball of wool that's full of knots is quite difficult because we're starting from the position it shouldn't be knotted. Where, as an example, one might think, but it's all wool. This is one long, 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 long piece of wool. It's not cut, it's not broken. It's just going on a very complicated journey from one end to the other. So, instead of focusing on my idea about how the wool should be or what I should be able to make with the wool, if I see that the wool is wool, then it's just wool. So this is like the absolute. Everything is empty. It has no inherent existence from this absolute point of view, whether it looks clean or dirty or beautiful or ugly, it doesn't make any true difference because it's simply patterns of emptiness. So this is the approach you will find in Mahamudra and Sokshen. So if we take a break now, uh, say for 25 minutes, and then we'll start to look at the text. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> so let's continue. So, as always, when we look at this kind of text, it's a, a series of processes. The first is a kind of desolidification, so that we start to see that. Uh, Phenomena are arising dynamically, moment by moment. So when we start, we look out at the world and we see things. Then we can start to recognize our own participation in this. That the things I see are my own interpretation. Then we see an interpretation is a process, it's a flow of thoughts and feelings and sensations moving together, then we can relax our identification with the elements in the flow, releasing ourselves from being a dualistic consciousness that is seeing this and thinking about this and liking or not liking this. And then we <clears throat> gradually become aware that Everything is moving in a space except for our own awareness. Thoughts come and go, feelings come and go, memories come and go. All experiences arise and pass. But the illumination of this, the uh, bright arena within which these forms are arising and passing, this is present. It's not present as someone or something, it's just present. This is the intrinsic clarity of our mind. So <clears throat> in the text, he's saying that uh, 
there are two aspects to the, the dharmas of actualization or becoming clear about what's going on. And the first aspect is the general condition of everything that is experienced. And the second aspect is more precisely uh, how we ourselves actually are. So how everything in is, is considered in these two aspects, the relative and the absolute that we've already touched on. In the relative, we operating with a duality that uh, I am here and the world is there. Gradually, through uh, observing our own mental process, we can free ourselves from the seemingly instinctive sense that there is something self-existing out there. But even after we have done this uh, process, which involves uh, refuge and bodhicitta, renunciation, and purification, we find that there are still subtle traces which can captivate us and, and act as a thin veil. He compares this to the way if a, a musk pod is kept in a box, when the pod itself is taken out, the smell lingers in the, in the substance of the box. And uh, in, in the Buddhist text, there's a lot of uh, discussion about the nature of these subtle traces or avaranas. They're, they're dangerous for us because they're not uh, big and uh, strongly impactful but because they are familiar, we can find ourselves falling into a habit formation without even knowing that we're doing it. Now, if you wanted to lose weight, you might decide to make sure you never had any biscuits in your house. So that prevents a sudden impulsive eating. But, but with the mind, it's more difficult because when the subtle uh, impulse arises, it's within us, through us. We don't have a front door barrier to it. So if you had to wash your dishes by hand with cold water, uh, it's likely that there's some subtle trace left on them. So in the, dog, in the Dzogchen tradition, the mind, uh, is described as having these two aspects, primordial purity and uh, instant presence or co-emergence. Primordial purity is the purity that has never been defiled. But when we're starting from our current confusion, uh, we can achieve the purity which is free of defilements but somehow there's a, a subtle limitation in this that, uh, oh yes, it's clean now because I cleaned it. So in the, in the deeper practice in Sokshen, we want to dissolve the uh, purity, which is free of defilements into the ground, primordial purity because as long as you go on a path going from one stage to another stage there is a sense of uh, progress or production or having achieved something and this gives the this subtle this this um, permits the presence of the subtle interpretation oh i did this i have achieved this if I hadn't done the practice, I wouldn't be like this today. And this keeps us trapped within the compounded, the contrived, the created. So, so then he, he says, for a Buddha who has totally abandoned these subtle habits, there are no such appearances whatsoever. And he abides solely in the absolute free of interpretation. 
So this is an encouragement to us to, to trust that uh, relaxing and releasing will bring us to the original uncontaminated purity. These are the two uh, main paradigms in, in, in Dharma. There are the paths of the cause, meaning you have a potential to get enlightened. And if you work on that cause and develop it, you can become enlightened. But we also have the vehicles or the, the ways of proceeding of the result. With this, we bring ourselves close to the result. The mind from the very beginning has the nature of Buddha. But this is hidden for us. We don't need to make Buddha or Buddhahood. We need to stop blinding ourselves to our own presence as Buddha. So this latter paradigm is the one that we follow in uh, Dzogchen. So then <clears throat> he says, to believe that the ordinary world and its inhabitants are real is the false relative. And uh, that's because as soon as you see something as real, the in, you need to work out what it is. The traditional challenge from a soldier on guard duty at night time they shout, friend or foe. So that's what we do. We look at the world, friend or foe, like or not like. And this fragments the world. Not only is there a differentiation of patterns of appearance, shapes and colors and so on, but they're reified into seemingly self-existing things which we then take to have intrinsic qualities. At the moment in uh, Tigre and this uh, border area of Ethiopia, there is a famine. The government doesn't want to let humanitarian aid into the people living in that area. Well, why would we feed our enemies? But we might say, yeah, but this is, uh, these are children. They are innocent. From the point of view of a binary opposition, the children of my enemies are enemy children. So we might say all sentient beings or all human beings are entitled to safety and protection and food. But inside this false relative, I know who you are. You try to kill our people. You are the enemy. You must die. You, your wife, your children, your mother, all of you. We see this throughout history, all across the world. When a, one group is clear that the other is intrinsically bad or dangerous, then the conclusion is we need to get rid of them. And the more both sides in a conflict arrive at a, <clears throat> a fixed definition of the negative qualities of the other side, then negotiation becomes impossible. Of course, human beings have many, many things in common. In fact, the majority of our qualities are very similar. But this is irrelevant when the strong definition that you are my enemy has come into play. So when we look at these situations, not only, sorry, when you go, then not only do we have uh, compassion for the children who are dying because of the parents' stupidity, but we have compassion for everyone involved because they are locked into a false, opposition, a duality which has no real basis to it, since there are no truly existing entities. So he's saying, um, 
the antidote to this false relative is to meditate on their transformation into the illusion like pure deities and mandala practice. And this is the pure relative. So in the last year, we brought out books, uh, Longing, for Lo Longing for Limitless Light about Amitabha and his pure land of Dewa Chen. And also Lotus Source about the pure lands on the Palri of Padmasambhava. In the tradition, many, many uh, meditators would spend a lot of time visualizing these pure lands and praying, making aspirations to be reborn there. In, in the world that we inhabit, there are many, many provocations. Things we like, things we don't like. We find ourselves reacting, although we have an intellectual understanding, it's all empty of existence. Because these five poisons or afflicting tendencies of uh, mental dullness, desire, aversion, pride and jealousy arise so quickly. Suddenly we are full of uh, jealousy or dislike. They blow in like the wind and we don't have time to think. We're already being carried by their force. Now, we might hope that we're going to get enlightened in one lifetime, but the years go by. We are all quite busy with this and that. The time we actually give to practice is maybe not so much. So that's why thinking of where we might go when we die is very important. Because the thing about the Pure Lands is that they are places where their illusory nature is upfront. It's the simple truth. We are illusion in the realm of illusion. There is nothing real here. And therefore, the factors which could confirm our habit of duality are gradually released and purified. Dharma centers are full of politics. Buddhist countries have lots of corruption and uh, bad behavior. The pure relative is not available here as something you can buy in the market. When we do our practice, we might imagine that we are Padmasambhava and everything we see is Padmasambhava. But unless we're in a long retreat, we're having to interact with people who have no idea about Padmasambhava and who think they know who we are. So we need to have faith in our practice, but also to avoid a spiritual pride that we can somehow <clears throat> deal with all the provocations that arise. So now he goes on to look at the absolute truth that which just is. So he says, the essence of the absolute is all encompassing space free of interpretation. So all encompassing space here is uh, my translation for the Dharma Dhatu. Space has no top or bottom side. It has no limit anywhere. It is all encompassing because if there is no boundary of inside and outside, everything is of itself within. What is within this space? Everything. Our bodies, our thoughts, our memories, our friends, our parents, the taxis, the cars, everything. All phenomena are within the space of emptiness. In the past, some of us have looked at the Heart Sutra, where it's saying that everything which you experience, whether it seems material or mental, is inseparable for, from emptiness because it lacks an inherent existence which would keep it apart from emptiness. Empty or emptiness means the quality of not having anything in it. 
Oh, so the traditional examples, uh, the 12 images of illusion, uh, like the mirage on the summer's road, uh, the reflection of the full moon on water, a rainbow in the sky. We see something, but it's not a something. When you look at the, the sea, you see the waves. It's undeniable that the waves are there, but the waves have no uh, private individual defining substance. They are all water. Whether they are big or small, moving quickly or slowly, they are water. So that's an example to give us a sense of what emptiness means. Everything is unborn. Uh, I could say a mere appearance. The rainbow has not somehow an existence of its own. It arises due to causes and circumstances. Simultaneously, it is and it isn't. This is the same for us. We are, but we don't know how we are going to be in one minute's time. We are, yes, but we are because our heart is beating and our breath is going in and out. We are a process. We are not a fixed thing. Although we have a name, and that seems to point to something which is reliably there, the actuality, the, the how it isness of how we manifest is inseparable for our being in the world with others. We are co-emergent with circumstances. I am not a thing, but that doesn't mean that I'm not here. I'm here, but not as a thing. I'm here as a pattern of participation within a field that I have never been separate from. So this is the sense of the Dharma Datu. All appearances are arising from and disappearing into this space of possibility. They are the showing of emptiness. Just as with the other example, many of us have looked at a lot, the mirror and the reflection. <clears throat> the mirror itself has no image. It is because it is empty of self or own image that it is able to show images which are not itself. And yet the reflection both is and isn't the mirror. There is appearance, but you cannot grasp it. You cannot get it. So, in the first teachings from the Buddha, he said, there is suffering. Secondly, he said, and suffering has a cause. And the cause is twofold. It's ignorance and uh, craving. It's ignorance of the way all forms arise in interdependence. When this is not clear, we imagine real phenomena and then we crave them. We want more of them if we like them and less of them if we don't like them. So with the absolute truth, we see directly that everything is illusory display. In Intensity doesn't prove existence. If I was being interrogated by some unpleasant police, they might shine a very bright light in my eye. Ah, this, I feel attacked. I'm attacked by a process. Ungraspable light is impacting me. The fact that there is an impact doesn't mean that light exists as something. So this is important when we look at ourselves, when we feel sad or lonely or that we failed or very happy. 
the intensity of these emotions seems to is establish that something real is going on. The intensity of the bad feeling seems to prove that there is a real thing which has caused it. But this is a, a false interpretation. Actually, the intense feels intense. That's it. If I stick my hand into the fire, it will burn. Something is happening. I know something's happening because I'm in pain. If I can get quickly to the hospital, the doctor looks at it. Oh, this is a process. All kinds of changes are occurring in your burnt fingers. After some time, the skin is going to peel off. And so we will have to apply this special kind of uh, support bandage uh, for that condition. So the process of hand in the fire, the process of how, the process of the doctor's diagnosis, the process of the treatment, these are flowing, flowing, flowing. I burnt my hand. I'm so stupid. These are solidifying conclusions. They're referring to processes. But the conclusion hides the dynamic nature of the process. So this is what he's saying is that this space within which these events are arising and passing is essentially free of interpretation. The interpretation comes after the moment of the event. You are interpreting your concept of the event. The immediacy is mediated through conceptualization. He's saying the absolute is not like that. There is nothing to think about, and so there is no thinking. Now, we are trained to believe that thinking is the main vehicle of establishing truth and clarity. But uh, in Dharma, we learn to turn towards the intrinsic illumination of the absolute. The clarity of the absolute is immediate, whereas the clarity generated by dualistic consciousness, organizing thoughts, is always uh, mediated and linear. Then he says, <clears throat> this absolute is indistinguishable from the essence of the two aspects of the relative, the pure and the false. Yet, there is a distinction made between the absolute and the relative. And he says this distinction is made according to uh, how the absolute is understood. So, when we <clears throat> practice in Dzogchen, uh, and we're looking at the first statement of Garab Dorji, to directly awaken to your original face or how you actually are, then the path is letting go of obscuration. So in the Guru Yoga, with the sound of Ah, we release all that the ego self has been relying on, and with that, the ego self is also released. That is the direct way. But we also have ways of uh, purification and so on. And if we follow that path, then it is as if we proceed from impure relative truth to pure relative truth to the absolute. But from the very beginning, all the forms of the relative have been within the absolute. So for meditators, this is very important. Sometimes people say uh, to me, <clears throat> yes, we have these uh, Dzogchen teachings, but I really don't like myself. I feel very bad of, because of the things I've done. Should I do some purification? So the, 
there is a crossroads. You have done bad things. You are an agent, an actor who does things. You act on the world, on other people. And what you have done is not good. Oh, you are a bad person. You'd better arrange to have a bath with Vajrasattva. What is Vajrasattva going to wash out? On an outer level, he's washing out the bad deeds and the tendencies that led to them. But on an inner level, he's washing out the belief in separate existent entities. He's washing out the delusion of duality. So the other fork, the other possibility at the crossroads is to sit with your own mind. The thought arises, I, I'm a really bad person. Then you have to take out your mala, your rosary beads, and start to count. I'm a really bad person, I'm a really bad person, I'm a really bad person. Uh -huh. Each time you say it, it vanishes. I'm a really bad person because I keep telling myself I'm a really bad person. The statement, I'm a bad person, has already dissolved. In the traditional example, they say it's like writing on water. If you put your finger into a bowl of water and try to write your name, the first letter has already dissolved by the time you get to the second one. What is it that's establishing the truth that I am a bad person? It is my own belief. It's an interpretation. And as he said, uh, all encompassing space is free of interpretation. So your own belief that you're a bad person is what keeps you separate from the inherent or intrinsic purity of the mind. But I did that bad thing. The doing of the bad thing arose due to causes and conditions. Don't be so proud. It's not all up to you. Your conceptualization was part of the deed, but many other factors were involved. All patternings of phenomena arise from causes. They have no inherent existence. Now, we have to be very careful here. A bad deed was done, but nobody did it. That could be ethically very uh, un unhelpful as a proposition. Well, it's not my fault. I didn't do it. Ah, but your delusion that you exist allowed you to mobilize your energy into the pattern of carrying out the deed. Okay, but don't blame me. Delusion did it. Okay, I'm going to give you a box. When you get home, take the delusion out of yourself, put it in a box and bring it here tomorrow. Oh, uh -huh. so you are deluded. So sit with your mind and the delusion will liberate because all arising things vanish. If you do not see clearly how the mind is, the practice of Sokshen is impossible. It helps to study but the main thing we need to study is ourselves. So, <clears throat> if we're taking this graded approach, seeing how uh, we take appearances to be real, including ourselves, and we have many strong feelings arising from this, then we need to see that there is no... Uh, reality to this self-construct. So this is why we have all the many different practices uh, on the path. We have refuge, bodhicitta, purification, mandala, nundro, and so on. 
they are all ways of thinning our grasping onto impermanent appearances as if they were real. The quicker way to do this is through the practice of Tantra. The deities that we uh, relate to in Tantra are all appearance and emptiness. In the visualization, we attempt to see them as clearly as possible. They are the appearance of emptiness. We start by thinking, oh, Tara, you are the appearance of emptiness, but I am the appearance of me. So then we pray to Tara. You are so kind, you are so bright, your light is wonderful, shine your light on me. Then <clears throat> we imagine white light is flowing into our body from her forehead. Appearance and emptiness means light. In, indeed, the word that we translate usually by appearance in, in Tibetan is also a word for light. So I imagine the white light is coming in and filling my body. Light is ungraspable appearance. Now, my body is full of things. It's not a good idea to make a hole and try to grasp your heart. If you squeezed your heart, you would die. Your heart is part of a dynamic system. Everything is arising in dependent origination. There's no heart operating without the lungs. And the lungs are operating because of the nervous system. This is a complex interplay of connectivity. Processes, not entities. The, the flow of energy. The flow of energy thickened by interpretive belief. So when the white light comes into my forehead and my body fills with white light, this is dissolving the appearance of materiality, which is on one level vibration. That's how what we take to be material manifests. And interpretation that's a mental formation that's also dissolving so my my body is full of pure white light then we have red light coming from her throat and i'm full of red light purifying all uh, seemingly substantial forms of language then from her heart blue light is coming into my heart and I am filled with blue light, the purification of the mind. This is uh, when I have a thought, I'm thirsty, it arises and passes. The, me the meaning of the thought is not inherent in the thought. It relates to my interpretation. The thought itself is already vanished. Thoughts, feelings, sensations are emergent and self-dissolving, self-arising and self-vanishing. So when we uh, do the practice of the deity, this is what we're doing. We're giving ourselves the direct experience that what we have been clinging to as a substantial basis for our separate identity is in fact an illusion. In Dzogchen, we don't go through the transformational process of Tantra. We go directly to the intrinsic uh, emptiness or purity of whatever we experience. But as uh, Dzogchen texts say, uh, be careful not to cheat yourself. These subtle traces that are illustrated by the example of the trace of the musk smell after the pod has been removed when you find yourself sitting in the practice but feeling a little cloudy or dull and you don't quite get it 
then it's very helpful to use duality to dissolve duality. <clears throat> you take your two hands, subject and object. You bring them together. Now, not two hands, not one hand. The hands are non-dual, subject and object are non-dual. And we bring them to our heart and we pray. I am lost. I am lost. Help me. And when you pray like that, you empty yourself out. No pride, no construction of identity. Just a small voice crying in the wilderness. Hell, hell. And when the heart opens, undefended, then Padmasambhava, Tara, and all the rest are there. Devotion warms the heart and dissolves the ice formation of the separate ego. So it's important not to make a hierarchy of practices and say this is more important than that. The most important thing is to see how you are tied in knots and you don't know how to untie them. So we say, Tara, save me. Now, in Tibetan, her name is Droma, which means the savioress. So if you say, save me, she thinks, oh, -ho, that's my job, of course. The Sambhogakaya, the pure realms of the deities is always here. It's not somewhere else. Always available but hidden from us by our self-construct. Dissolving the self-construct into the openness of devotion is a very quick way of awakening to the mind itself. So now we have a break for just under an hour and back at two o'clock English time. Good, see you then. Okay, <clears throat> I don't seem to be able to pin you, Kati, so we'll just go by sound, because I've got the, the German sound. Okay, so he says, <clears throat> at first there is both appearance and attachment. Meaning this is this uh, false or impure relative truth. Then there is only appearance without any attachment. This is pure relative truth. At this stage, there is still uh, someone experiencing the appearance. It's still dualistic, but there is no investment in particular forms from an ego position. And then he says, and finally, there is the absence of both appearance and attachment. The, the, both appearance and attachment. It doesn't mean, of course, that uh, in absolute truth, where the, the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas uh, has no experience at all but it's indicating that there is not even the slightest uh, tilt towards any specific appearance. Everything is equal in emptiness. So although there is diversity, there is no separation of these uh, four of the forms that might be identified in in the diversity. So to use the earlier example, it's like looking at the sea. Oh, water. All the waves are water. That's the truth of them. So the different qualities that might be attributed to, to various waves are irrelevant and don't arise. 
So he says, although this absolute truth is beyond the limits of uh, understanding and interpretation, in order to give uh, people who are new to exploring this uh, absolute nature uh, a, a, a helping hand, he makes use of notions of understanding and not understanding. That is to say, if you if you speak too much from the absolute, it can be very persecutory for people who are in the relative. So nowadays, when some Western people uh, become teachers of uh, Advaita Vedanta, they say either you get it or you don't get it. There's nothing to be done, which is true from the absolute point of view. <clears throat> but not true from the relative point of view. If these uh, Advaita teachers would be deprived of food and water for a month, they might be more sympathetic towards the relative. It's all very well to say everything's illusion, but life can be difficult. So, then he says, in order to actualize, in order to awaken to the ultimate inseparability of the two truths, we must see that to interpret the relative as really existing and the absolute as not existing is to not be in accordance with the middle way. The relative doesn't uh, exist and the absolute is not nothing at all they exist together or they are together as non-dual empty appearance if this was not the case then the buddhas would have no means to communicate with us the relative uh, is where we find the pain of our life the Buddha wants to help us be free of this pain by showing us the inseparability of the relative and the absolute, appearance and emptiness. The absolute is not apart from the relative. The relative doesn't contaminate the absolute. So if we simply say the ground of everything is the absolute and everything is illusion, then we should remember what the heavyweight boxer Mike Tyson said. Everyone's a hero till they get punched in the face. Oh, it's like that. Life happens and it seems very intense. In these situations, if you haven't uh, awakened to the non duality of the unborn and the um, appearing, which is also a form of the unborn then it's as if you suddenly uh, fall from your free open space. So let's look again at the Dharma Datu, all encompassing space. I've also translated it as infinite hospitality. Everything is within this openness. Winning, losing, fame, notoriety, every possible kind of experience is not other than the empty ground. So however your life is, don't make it uh, real and separate by investing too much density into it. Sometimes life is hard. We feel lost and miserable. Lost and miserable are moods or flavors of experience when they're not proofs of reality so we take the middle way when i'm sad i'm sad when i'm happy i'm happy in both situations i'm allowing the arising well, allowing is the wrong word I'm with the arising of this uh, particular uh, flavor or coloration, and then it's gone. 
So whether we feel pathetic or useless or wonderful, whether we have success or failure, don't invest the appearance with a reality. So the texts often say, if you go to heaven, go to heaven. If you go to hell, go to hell. That is to say, if you stay present and open, however it is, it's just something passing through. But if you grasp at it as being something real, and especially as something which is a real definition of you, then many dangers occur. For example, self-pity. I, why do I feel so bad? These friends of mine, they don't feel bad. They've got happy lives. Why don't I have a happy life? Or we can start to imagine that someone else has created the negative conditions that give rise to these experiences. Or if uh, experience we, we take to be positive arise, we can distill some sense that we are special people and we are entitled to feel in this wonderful way. It's not non-existent and it's not existent. That is to say, it's not true, it's not something enduring, and on the other hand, it's not nothing at all. So, the trouble is not caused by the particular quality of what is occurring, but what we do with it. What is arising is a, a moment in the flow, a wave of experience. If we grasp it as something and come to a conclusion about the event, about the other people, about ourselves, then <clears throat> all kinds of elaborations follow. The moment itself has gone. Because of the self-liberation of all phenomena, that is to say, the fact that they have no self-existence and so always vanish, shows that the problem doesn't lie in the object or what occurs, nor does it lie in the true nature of the experiencer? Because when we look for the mind, we don't find a thing. The problem arises from reification, relativization, this compared to that, and judgment. Subject and object are co-emergent, moving together, always together. There's no object without a subject and no subject without an object. We are not the subject. The energy of the mind manifests in moments of subjectivity. The subject, the, the emergent I, we can't say it's self and we can't say it's not self. But if we say this is me, and I'm not you. This separation allows the basis for all kinds of um, splitting and projection. So again and again, we see that there are no fixed entities, but from one point of view, there is ceaseless flow, but I'm not in the flow being carried along like a leaf on the river. The flow is the interplay of subject and object, changing patterns, positions, sometimes in charge, sometimes not in charge. We know our life, we're pulsating in this way all the time. But when a conclusion arrives from that process of reification and judgment and so on, it's like a, free, it's like a freezing of the water. When subject and object are frozen, they have different shapes. And so it seems to be possible to see them as oppositional. So, so that, that takes us back to the 
second noble truth taught by the Buddha. The, the, the cause of suffering is ignorance and craving. We don't see dependent co-origination. We don't see this uh, interactive movement which goes on and on and on. And although our experience is always changing, we still manage to maintain the delusion of being a fixed self. And then we grasp at this as good or grasp at this as bad. Now, this is not philosophy. This is not speculation. This is something you can see for yourself if you look at your own daily experience. Often our life is not so easy. But it, it goes on. Yet, somebody can say something and we suddenly feel very hurt. Why did they say that? Try to work it out. We're doing ghost analysis. The life of the moment has died, it has vanished. We're thinking about ghosts and echoes and somehow we can't let go. It's not right, they shouldn't have done it. Then you can see that Pato Rinpoche is describing your mind. Now you have appearance and attachment and that's the false relative truth. And that's the sight of suffering. So it's not surprising you're unhappy. But there are easier ways to prove the truth of the Buddha's teachings. So then he's quoting the Prajaparamita literature, the transcendent wisdom literature. Whatever is the actual truth or as it isness of the relative, that also is the actual truth or the as it isness of the absolute. So fundamentally, there is no difference between absolute and relative truth. But then he continues saying, in order to uh, give beginners a chance to understand this, uh, we can distinguish between these two truths. And in this frame, the experience of delusion is the appearance of many real entities. This is what's called the relative. <clears throat> so delusion is a kind of thickening or increasing obscuration with regard to what is illusory. So an image that's used in some of the uh, Mahamudra literature is that uh, up in the mountains, if a thirsty deer sees uh, a mirage, it runs towards it and can leap over the cliff to its death. The mirage is an illusion. It's an appearance which is empty of substance. But we, when we project our belief into it, oh, it really is water, then this excess of uh, investment, of identification, operates as a delusion. We don't know what's going on. So that's what he's saying here, is that when we look around the world and we see many real entities, real separate things, we are deluded. We, because it's not just the sense that there is something real, but that becomes a foundation on which you can uh, attach lots of qualities. So when I look out my window just now, I see uh, a car, quite an expensive car. So I've just told you a lie. What I see is colors and shape. This is called a car. That is to say the sign the identificatory sign motor car can be applied to this patterning of illusion. But once I think, oh, it is a car, 
then like vultures gathering around a corpse, many associations arrive. It's an expensive car. That family had two cars. Oh, oh how do they make their money? Hmm, maybe some trouble is going on in that house. You could have envy, you could have a desire to phone the police and inform them that they're drug dealers. All of these associations and thoughts land on, oh, this is an expensive car. And the interesting thing, if you observe this for yourself, is the more your associations arrive, the more they polish the object, it, uh, it starts to be very bright. It ref sorry, it's reflecting light. It's impenetrable to insight. So the, the reification, the turning of the shape into a noun, it is a car which supports further associations and interpretations, creates a shiny, impenetrable surface, which confirms it is, it is what it is. So this is delusion. This car is not deluding me. I am deluding myself on the basis of the complex interpretations I bring to the car. Now, I can do the same thing to people walking in the road, to dogs, to birds in the sky, to trees. That's an awful lot of deluded objects. How will I get out of this jungle? But the answer is clear. The objects are not deluded, I'm deluded. The answer doesn't lie in the object. So we can do a very simple practice look at something in your room now you know what looking is then you turn that towards yourself look for your mind you see thoughts appear feelings memories not the mind not the mind not the mind if you look for the mind you find liberation from the delusion of self if you look in the world, you just get uh, more basis for self-confusion. So then he quotes uh, Shantideva, who says, when both existence and non-existence cease to be present to the mind, there is nothing else. Being free of perception, mind is truly at peace. Existence and non-existence are interpretations. He's saying, he's not talking about things out there that are arising and coming at you. It means when the habit of organizing experience in terms of existence and non-existence, that is to say, in terms of binary oppositions, then without this oppositional structure there is nothing else because if i say i am a man that's because i'm not a woman so when i say man the invisible partner to this is non-woman when you say man it looks like something oh he's a man but man has no meaning without not woman so this this is how the binary or dualistic structure of conceptualization generates the experience of real entities which have an excluded opposite so whenever you're looking at something where is Cinderella? She used to be in the main house, but her place has been taken by the two ugly stepsisters. Cinderella is there, but invisible. So it is the same for us. 
Where is the abandoned twin? This is an apple. The abandoned twin is all other fruit. Because the apple stands in relation to not grapes, not pear. And the more something is defined, you see there is a more intimate exclusion. There are many kinds of apples. So if I say this is a, I don't know, a Cox's Pippin, then all the other kinds of apples are not there, but they are there because they're not there as there allows the Cox to be there. So as a basic um, formula, you could uh, explore the ego self is always exclusive. I'm, I am me, I'm not you. The mind of the Buddha is inclusive. The Buddha has awareness, open, present, but no identity. Because the Buddha shows different forms according to the needs of beings. If you try to define the Buddha, you're just exploring your own capacity for conceptualization. Whatever is established as something can only be something by the exclusion of this, all that is not this something. Oh, back with the old example, when Archimedes got in the bath and the water splashed over the side, the volume of his body displaced the equal volume of water. So if I say, basically, I'm Scottish. In the assertion of that, all the other things that I am are at least momentarily excluded. I then have to drop the primary identification with being Scottish in order to be a man. Now, being Scottish doesn't exclude women, but being a man excludes women. So you can look for yourself, whatever momentary definition you have of yourself and say, I am this or I am like this, there is an implicit exclusion, a displacement. Usually we don't see this, but sometimes it manifests. So when you have, for example, uh, a lot of immigration, then the right-wing people might be protesting and say, England for the English. These people shouldn't be here. But then someone in the crowd may have been from a family from India. They have a British passport. Then they're saying, England for the English, keep these foreigners out. Then maybe I'm standing next to the person, I'm thinking, are you, are you English? Are you English? Yeah. Are you the, the proper English? Yeah, you see, as soon as you have a, a shape or a form or a, an identity, it will be excluding something else. And then you say, oh, these bloody foreigners, they come here, they spoil our culture as if the culture was one simple thing. In terms of these foreigners, England is England. But inside England, people in London don't like the people from the north so much. They think, oh, Newcastle, who would want to live there? then inside Newcastle, for sure, there will be a division from people on the west side or the east side of the city. So if you, if you see the principle that operates here, you can see how terribly sad this is. Apart from its stupidity and the way it often leads to great cruelty and even genocide, it's very sad because it imagines that 
there is a purity which has to defend itself against contamination. Now, the Dharma Datu, the infinite hospitality, has no specific identity. All are welcome as they are. Because all the forms belong here, emerge here, are part of the being here-ness, no form is more here or has more belonging than any other form. Nothing is special. Or everything is special. But nothing is more special than anything else. This is the evenness which is uh, the purification of the poison of pride. So I hope this gives you some sense of how in your own mind delusion arises very easily. It's not that we are bad people to be deluded. It's not a punishment for something. It's what occurs when there is identification with uh, a narrow set of factors as being I, me, myself. We don't have a fixed identity. Now, uh, at my age, my identity is blowing away day by day like the leaves from the autumn trees. I forget more things. When there are problems with the computer and people helpfully say, oh, this is what you have to do, I don't want to know. My time for learning new things like that is gone. I would prefer just to sit and look at the screen and nothing is happening. Like with the trees, when autumn comes, the sap is going down into the roots. And the same with age. We, our energy draws back into the heart chakra. No doubt the world is full of exciting things, but I'm not so interested. So that's a phase or a mood of my life at this stage. It wasn't always like that, of course, but it arises like this due to causes and conditions. So the key thing here is we can't grasp ourselves. We can't say anything definitive about who we are. And we can't grasp other people. We can't nail them down or put them in a box. So this craving, longing, grasping, needing something, we start to see as how we make our own prison. So we don't need to study a lot of texts just observe yourself and other people you see the children playing but you no longer play like that you have lost so many of the identities you once inhabited so again it's the middle way we're not trying to get rid of any identity otherwise we just be a big empty space Rather, we want to see that my identities, multifold, arise, co-emergent with different situations. I don't exist, sorry, I don't exist as someone or something, but at any moment, aspects of my open potential will be evoked by the patterning of my environment. So again, you can see this in relation to Shanti Deva. This is neither existent nor non-existent. He says, being free of perception means not seeing myself as something, not seeing you as something. Mind is truly at peace. It's not at peace because it's hiding from what's occurring. It means I see, but my seeing is freed from the need to grasp what I see, to turn it into something. So, if we go back, when we looked at <clears throat> the meaning of relative truth, it's like fiction, it's imagined. 
but in the in the false or limited uh, relative truth, we're we're trying to convince ourselves that what is imagined is real. But if we stop cheating ourselves in this way, then we see, oh yes, it's an illusion. Because sometimes I'm like this, sometimes I'm like that. Just as the mirage arises from the heat of the sun, the density of the air and the angle of the light. So this energy formation or potential, which I can call myself, sometimes looks happy, sometimes looks sad, according to circumstances. I don't have a fixed identity to defend. For example, when I started to look through this uh, text, I found many mistakes. So, if I have as part of my repertoire of James, uh, someone who makes mistakes, then it's quite easy to say, yeah, I made quite a lot of mistakes. There are spelling mistakes, punctuation mistakes, and so on. I make mistakes, I get tired, this happens, that happens. None of these is definitive of who I am. I am the empty space of the emergence of infinite patterns in response to infinite patterns. So he says, with regard to uh, actuality or seeing clearly, the truth which is to be awakened to, which is the great, the ultimate great all pervading space free of interpretation, this is without any basis for the discrimination of the two truths, and so one should not discriminate. Everything you see, hear, smell, taste, this is not other than the openness of the ground. When you look in the mirror, you see, you see reflections. The reflection is the mirror and isn't the mirror. Your thoughts are the mind and aren't the mind. They are the mind because the only place you find them is in your mind. And yet they don't define your mind. And because the thoughts are inseparable from the mind and the mind is empty the formations or patterns established with these thoughts is also empty so sometimes i feel a bit lazy so i'm lazy there's no need for any guilt or shame because there is no one who is lazy. Laziness is just a mood of the weather. It blows in on the wind and then blows out again. The patterns of appearance don't define any essence. You cannot define yourself. And yet you are. You're not, you're not vague. We'll, we'll have a break in a moment. You maybe go to the kitchen, you make a tea or a coffee or drink some water. Your action is quite precise, but it doesn't define who you are. No one can catch you. Now, many people have been shamed in childhood. Perhaps you weren't the kind of child your parents had hoped for. Or Perhaps you tried so hard to be the kind of child they wanted that you lost any sense of your authentic presence. Whether you have been trying to establish an identity or they were trying to impose an identity, very often there is a heartbreak around the, the fact that these identities don't quite fit. They're like shoes that are too small or too big. Our mind is empty. You can't grasp it. It's radiant, illuminating all this, 
which you can't grasp. And moment by moment, your embodied participation is responding to circumstances and you can't grasp any definitive shaping of what you call yourself. So he says to awaken to this, to, to make it actual and living for yourself is the non-dual original knowing, which is the understanding of all the Buddhas. So then he says, truly knowing the two truths as they are separately, they both become merged inseparably as the non-dual original knowing of union. And he says, this, this is the liberation which does not abide anywhere. So he's saying, whether you really investigate how things appear, you will find they are empty. Whether you go in the other direction and find the absolute quality of the mind that it's empty of any self substance, you will find that it is effortlessly filling moment by moment with this field of experience. Whether you look to the object or to the subject, either way, in the truth, they are empty. And this is the union or the inseparability of the two truths. And this is a liberation from all limitations, a liberation which doesn't uh, sit anywhere or rest on anything. The mind is self-filling and self-emptying and everything arises and nothing is established. To rest in this is itself liberation. Okay, so we have a break until quarter two. See you then. Okay. So oh, I hope you have some sense that uh, what we've been looking at is a is an aspect of practice. It's not theory it's something we have to uh, bring into how we approach our daily life so then he's saying that uh, you may understand the truth of this or um, as it is the, the the true way of being of all phenomena if you keep your focus on what is around you and you don't apply it to the subtle forces which arise in your own mind to the, po the five poisons or afflictions, then your own experience becomes a source of uh, pride and craving. That is to say, if you, if you see that all that you experience uh, is empty of inherent existence, but you think that you exist, you the knower, ah, I understand, then this is uh, going in the wrong direction. And if we do that, he says, due to this, belief in one's own true existence grows stronger. So it's important to awaken to or actualize how one truly is in oneself, in one's mental activity, in one's mind, in one's intellect. Oh, for example, you know if you're sad or a thought comes in your mind and you have a sense that something's happening or that you're thinking something but intelligence is different uh, many people who are not very intelligent think they are intelligent many people like that are involved in british politics they are convinced that they understand everything when they are pretty obviously stupid. Now, intelligence is not an object. It's a kind of medium for the uh, revelation and processing of experiences. So sometimes our mind is more bright and clear and sometimes it's more cloudy. So he's saying, you need to be present with how you are. And 
linking this to what we did just previously, there is no advantage in pretending. Some days we're dull. Other, other days we're more bright. Even if we don't want to tell other people about this, we at least need to know it for ourselves. It's not something shameful or bad. It's the truth of the fact that I do not exist as someone with fixed qualities. We are co-emergent with circumstances. Therefore, rather than having a preposition, uh, a fixed belief about oneself, we want to be present and simply attend to the patterning which arises in the formation we might call ourselves. So he says, whoever is the knower of the knowledge must be directly awakened to. I know I am in London. That is to say, some thought arises in me, I am in London. In a situation like that, the thought, I am in London, is a, it is as if that is the knower of the fact. So the, this point is a little bit um, tricky, a little bit you have to be careful. As a subject, I, I, I merge with my thoughts. The thought, I am in London, I am in London. <clears throat> but the thought, I am in London, arises. I am aware of it arising. Who is the thinker of the thought? No one. Who is the knower of the thought? The awareness which is not someone. Things come to mind. <clears throat> I found myself saying, that is to say, the field or the arena of experience finds a voice through me. When I'm speaking with you now, I don't know what I'm going to say. The seeing arises through the connectivity. Now, looking at a computer screen is not nearly as nice as seeing your live faces. But nonetheless, I have some felt sense of at least a few of you that I see on my screen. And with the sense of your presence, I'm speaking. Now, I am speaking. We could hear that in various ways. I am the agent, the doer. I'm doing the speaking. <clears throat> Or I could say, speaking is speaking through me, or speaking is speaking me. I find myself speaking. It comes to me, through me, with you. Without you, it wouldn't be coming through me. This is the, the, the sense of the term co-emergence. Geographically, you may be far away, but it is with my sense of you that my speaking is evoked or released. So, in terms of meditation, this is uh, very interesting. I am not a solitary, uh, isolated ego self. My life is manifesting in relationship it's not relationship that i have but rather the how i am or how i emerge is generated by the quality of relatedness relationship speaks me thinks me and through this i have feelings and sensations so if you if you can see this in your own experience, then you directly see subject and object arise together. So I can feel my weight 
as it's revealed by the pressure on the seat. Where my bum and the seat meet together, there is sensation. This sensation arises from the meeting of the object and the subject. It's not that I feel the chair. I am the isolated subject that just happens to be in contact with the chair. But the contact gives rise to the sensation. So this is the union of subject and object. Just as my sense of you gives rise to my speaking. Oh. <clears throat> so he's saying here, whoever is the knower of the knowledge must be directly awakened to. The knower of the knowledge is a visitor. We all know this. You try to remember someone's name. Your mind is blank. Then after some time, it suddenly arises. The knower of the knowledge was the thought that carried the knowledge. When you were at school and you had to prepare for exams, you're doing revision. It's as if you're polishing pathways that will give you access to this information. So when the question arises, you start to write your answer. If that question hadn't been on the exam paper, you wouldn't have been writing that answer. The question brings a patterning of information it evokes it so that it flows through you. So I'm trying to encourage you to observe how it is for you. You don't need to have the concept of a, an ego self to do this. Say you've misplaced your keys. Trying to think. Then it comes to you. Oh God, I left them in the kitchen. Who thought that thought? I didn't think that thought because I lost the keys. Oh, it's, it's the connectivity that brings the thought. There is no thinker of the thought, no ego self that's got the little factory pumping these things out. This is why if we have anxiety, like in going for a job interview, we might not do very well because we're trying to think, what should I say to these people? Too much thinking. It's making a kind of screen between me and the contact. And maybe I say something not very good. Then I think, oh God, they're looking at me. I feel I'm really examined. I'm like an object. Then it's very hard to speak. We probably all have this kind of experience. Then if we relax, it flows again. The like intelligence is the flow of connectivity. So if we want to find this knower, there are two aspects, he says. So we need to know these uh, two aspects of the truth, the relative and the absolute and their inseparability. So he then says, we, we have to see that as a general principle everywhere, all relative appearances have no internal self-definition self and are like illusion. And from the absolute point of view, they neither exist nor do not exist. They're just like the sky. When you go for a walk and you look at the sky, you can't say it's not there, and yet it's not here as something. Maybe the clouds are here as something, or the rainbows, or the moon, but not the sky. So, the, the, what we need for the, to get this pure relative truth is to understand the 
the great middle way or the great uh, avoidance of the extremes, which is the ultimate inseparability of the two truths. And he says, and we do this by means of the intellect augmentation. That is to say, we have to study these teachings and reflect on them and apply them to uh, our own experience. So again, again, he quotes Shantideva, the absolute is not within the sphere of the intellect. The intellect desires the relative. That is to say, you cannot think yourself to the absolute or to emptiness. So the great Indian uh, philosopher and yogi Nagarjuna was famous for adopting the path of negation. He didn't make any uh, formulation of how the absolute is, but he reviewed the propositions put forward by other thinkers and always came to the conclusion neti neti not this not this now this doesn't mean it has nothing to do with us but what it means is it has nothing much to do with the structure of our ego the ego is the the aspect of ourself that's always trying to apprehend or catch something so we say ah now i understand but that's uh that can't be applied to the absolute it's not something you understand we are the absolute and we are the, the relative and we are the non-duality so he's in a sense he's saying use your intellectual understanding to loosen up the structures that you stand on the, the assumptions that you carry but be careful <clears throat> my my teacher always said that Manjushri, the Bodhisattva who represents uh, intelligence and wisdom and understanding, he holds a sword. And this sword has a, a blade which is sharp on both sides. So he can cut out and he also cuts in. So if you enjoy being someone who knows something, you're using the sword to cut up the world into digestible pieces. But if the sword comes back, it'll slice you up too. So that's why Pataribhuti says, thus towards whatever intellectual understanding one has, if pride and craving arise, then that pride and craving is the work of demonic delusion and due to it, one's understanding will become false. So some of us have looked at this issue before. <clears throat> what we want is knowing, which is a, a capacity, a potential, but it's not pre-shaped. So I have a hand, my hand can do many things, and it can pick up the pen. I hold the pen, this gives me power, but I'm also the prisoner of the pen. In order to hold the pen, I give up my freedom. I get my freedom back by giving up the pen. So this is what he's saying, that if you have pride and craving to know something, to be an expert, to be a specialist, then your mind closes around this information, this knowledge in the way your hand closes around the pen. Liberation comes from the subject. The pure state of the subject is unborn awareness. This is always empty. It has no fixed content. That's why it can reveal everything. The empty cup has the greatest potential. 
if you put orange juice into the cup, <clears throat> but you only had enough to half fill it, it's probably not beneficial to top it up with coffee because the orange juice is exclusive. It's saying, keep out, I am orange juice. I am Scottish, I am male. All of these identities and definitions are limitations. Now, it's not an either or, because our mind is always filling and emptying with experience. So, if you were a parent, <clears throat> and you might be at home quite happily, and then there's a banging on the door and they cry and it's your small child and they're saying, mama, mama. You rush, you're upset, what's the matter? You don't say, all oh, these fucking children, I'm happy, go away. Your happiness is gone. But you're full of concern for the child. This is our mind. So we fill, we empty situationally. The block is to take up a position. This is me, this is how I am. So it's the same saying, I am a scholar, I understand these things. It this looks powerful, it looks to be someone but it's a demonic delusion. The knowledge you have in your mind is a sign of your very slow metabolism and evacuation process. When you were born, you didn't know very much. Then you learn lots and lots of things. And if you live long enough, you will forget everything you know. You'll just be sitting in your chair looking, oh, oh, happy to be here. Where am I? So when you are full of knowledge, this is just constipation. Sooner or later, the shit will vanish. So that's why he says it's a demonic delusion. And, and if you hold on to that uh, concretize that uh, substantialization that making it some definite thing your understanding will become false because the knowledge will have been established inside the binary opposition of knowing and not knowing so then he quotes the sutra and which says what is called attainment is unstable what is called clear realization is greed in our life, we have had many different kinds of attainments. Learning to ride a bicycle, climbing trees, learning another language. You have an achievement, but it's unstable. If the government decided that uh, everyone had to retake their final school exam, this might be a bit of a problem because we we have that attainment was unstable in the same way he says what is called clear realization is greed you seem to have some insight things become a bit clearer you have a good meditation oh that was a an experience but it tasted good. I like it. I want more. I want it to come back. So this is the meaning of greed here. You turn a bright revelation, an insight into a commodity that you could try to hang on to and increase. So he says this instability and greed are the work of demonic delusion. Now, it, the formulation that it's a demonic delusion is quite helpful. 
he's not saying that if it happens to you, you are deluded and you are a bad person. What he's saying is, until you are established in the non-duality of emptiness and appearance, emptiness and clarity and so on, you can fall under the power of demonic delusion. Don't blame the object, don't blame yourself. But be aware of your tendency to cling on to experiences as if they were an enduring truth. So he says, those with great pride believe I have gained this. Well, that's pretty obvious. <clears throat> and that way, you, that way we become stupid. What is called my clear realization becomes discursive thought. <clears throat> this is like going on holiday, watching the sunset, and taking photographs of it. The immediacy of the sunset has been turned into a second order representation. If you grasp the transient meaning and you formulate it as part of a narrative of who you are and what you understand, its freshness is lost and it becomes discursive thought. <clears throat> oh, this text is a little bit dense and I want to us to make good progress with it so I'm not bringing in pauses for meditation but uh, we can you can do your own practice in the evening or in the breaks and so on because uh, you want your mind to be soft and uh, responsive to get the, the flavor of the text <clears throat> So he says, the unmediated actuality or the, <clears throat> the direct <clears throat> awakening or clarity to how it is, when this is applied to relative intellectual understanding, this is absolute. That is to say, <clears throat> if you understand that thoughts are ungraspable, arising like rainbows and you relax from appropriation to grasp from grasping to uh, an aesthetic appreciation then you have full receptivity and full release so this is the absolute this is the dharmakaya of the buddha open to everything and not caught by anything, undefended, but not vulnerable. So he says, if you examine yourself as the mind or consciousness or intellect that understands, then you will see that in no way is it a substantial entity. You are not a thing. Your mind isn't a thing. The space of the mind isn't a thing. Thoughts, feelings, memories, plans are not things. <clears throat> the mind is the space within which appearance occurs. The mind is the illumination of the space within which appearances occur. The mind is the appearances which are illuminated by the brightness of the space within which these appearances come. So you have to look again and again for your mind. <clears throat> Some of us have looked many times with the five questions. Does the mind have shape and color? A size? Does it come from somewhere? Stay someplace? go someplace these uh, five questions are very helpful for getting close to the immediacy of how your mind is but we need the direct experience not just knowledge about it if you are eating a sandwich 
and I am watching you eating the sandwich. I can have knowledge about the sandwich you are eating, but I remain hungry. We need direct experience. So then he's more precise now. From the very beginning, mind has been empty of existing and not existing. Now, we feel that we exist. I'm here. This is the ego self as a proposition. The ego self is not the mind. The ego self is a patterning of the potential of the mind. It is within the mind that it seems to position itself apart from the mind. <clears throat> so I might say to you, oh, let me tell you about my mind. From the very beginning, it has been empty of existing and not existing. This is telling you a story. We use the stories to awaken from the need for stories. Parents tell children, go to sleep stories. The Buddha tells us, wake up stories. But we, being very perverse, we can turn the Buddha's wake up story into a good night story. Mm. So, empty of existing and not existing he's saying look at this till it's clear for you <clears throat> i exist really you might say this you might believe this but it's not true because you're changing you manifest that's undeniable but you don't exist as something because you're not a something. <clears throat> like, the te <clears throat> like the text say, you have to put this on your tongue till you taste it. The words are not enough. Your mind has been empty of beginning and ending, of coming and going, of permanence and impermanence of past, present, and future, and is therefore called the absolute actuality. <clears throat> what it means is, uh, in being empty of these things, intrinsically, intrinsically empty of these things, it is also available for transient uh, hospitality towards these things. It's not that we have two minds, a good mind and a bad mind. <clears throat> but the mind can be uh, present as it is, or it can be veiled uh, through merging it with concepts. But beginning and ending that's what happens with thoughts. They arise and pass, coming and going. Feelings come and go. The mind is like the sky. Planes come, atom bombs explode, birds fly through it, storm clouds, rainbows. When, the cl when you see a cloud in the sky, the sky is empty of the cloud because the cloud doesn't touch the sky. In the same way, <clears throat> and you can check this again and again, the mirror is empty of the reflection. So you go and look in a mirror, oh, my reflection, it's in the mirror. That's definite. But then you move away and something else is reflected. The mirror was not touched by the reflection. It shows, but it is not touched. <clears throat> the sky shows the rainbow, shows the cloud, 
but it is not touched or contaminated or conditioned or modified by what is arising. So this is the absolute actuality. So we come back again and again to the same point. It's not either or. It's both and. The absolute is full of the relative without becoming relative. So when he says that it's empty of existing and non-existing, that's like saying <clears throat> the mirror is empty of reflections. The, the reflection is in the mirror, but the empty, fresh potential of the mirror to show reflections is not limited or conditioned by this reflection. So this is central if you want to practice Dzogchen or Mahamudra. What we call samsara or limitation or my mistakes or my confusion or my faults is not other than the infinite openness of the mind. But I did that bad thing. That's a series of words. But I did that bad thing. Each word arises and vanishes. Nothing is established. But due to my grasping, due to my pre-existing belief, I exist, I am a bad person, I should not have done that. <clears throat> then it is as if something is established. But that is delusion. Delusion is believing that something which is not true is true. So he then uh, quotes another sutra, mind is not within and neither is it without. And it cannot be perceived as something other than these. As we have looked already, although I can say my mind, which grammatically seems to indicate that my mind is something I possess. In fact, it's the other way around. Mind shows me. I, me, myself are um, patternings within the flow of experience revealed by the mind. So the mind is not inside me. It's not like my kidneys or liver. <clears throat> and neither is it without, meaning outside, um, like my shoes. And it cannot be perceived as something other than these. Because whatever you experience as inside you is there revealed as an experience of the mind. And whatever you experience outside yourself cars, expensive cars, or trees, or people. This is the experience of the mind. Everything is the experience revealed by, in, for the mind. So then he quotes another <clears throat> uh, sutra, one from a Sangha. He says, mind is without form, without color, and without resting place, just like the sky. The most important part of our practice is to give ourselves the space and the holiday from busy conceptualization so that we can become close to our mind as it is. We look again and again, we see the mind has no form. And yet, that absence of form doesn't mean a kind of void, oblivion, a non-existence. Because my freedom to have a thousand forms is dependent on the absence of a fixed form for my mind. So I can feel happy or sad because my mind is not intrinsically happy or sad. My mind has no intrinsic quality except being empty of any intrinsic qualities. But because it's both and, 
having no intrinsic quality and being open to the movement of experience, what is revealed to us is the flow of experience in the pulsation of subject and object. <clears throat> so at the moment, my mind, if you like, is the, the stage or the arena within which is arising my body, the screen in front of me, the images that I see of a few of you, the sense of the room around, what's outside the window. Now, in a few minutes, we will come to an end. So I would like to reassure you that although you will vanish from my computer, I will not be sitting here all night looking at the computer, praying for your return so that I can be me again. Because there are many sources of me being me. Subject and object are co-emergent. <clears throat> the mind is not emergent. You can look in the mirror for hours and the mirror will not emerge. You can move, <clears throat> you can move your face around and different uh, ex expressions will arise in the mirror. But that is reflection. So this is like our experience is like the reflection arising and passing due to circumstances. No matter what patterns of arising occur, it doesn't stain the mind, it doesn't mark the mind, the mind is fresh. <clears throat> However, if our attention is strongly fixated on the patterning of what is arising so that it seems to be the whole truth, then the openness of the mind will remain unavailable for us, although it is always open and here. So this is the practice. <clears throat> Firstly, make friends with impermanence, outer impermanence, the seasons, the movement of people in the street and so on. The impermanence of your gesture, your what you're saying, the rhythms of your breathing and so on. <clears throat> then pay attention to thoughts, feelings, sensations, memories. To do this, we simply sit, relax, and here we are. <clears throat> then the instruction is don't merge into whatever arises. Don't, don't hold yourself back and away from what's arising. Just open and present. If you like, we go into the state of the mirror or the state of the sky. This optimizes our uh, capacity to see a thought coming and going, feeling coming and going with clarity, but without involvement. Good. So this is our end for today. We're back again tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock. You may have a busy evening ahead of you. Whatever's happening, simply be aware of the movement of experience. Okay, see you guys tomorrow. Have a good evening. No. Thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, 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 So, good morning. We have time to go deeper into this text. Uh, yesterday I said something about um, pure lands. I can't, let me see, I can't hear Kati. The, where is the German? Okay. Uh, 
So we touched briefly touched on pure lands yesterday. Oh, this world that we are in, difficult and troubling as it is, is our karmic vision. The more we uh, ease ourselves from reliance on generalized assumptions, such as I'm living in England, where there is a term like England, which refers to so many things, it's pretty much meaningless. If I then start to focus on the unique specificity of my experience, I realize that uh, my life, my world, is something revealed to me and not to anyone else. Only in terms of concepts do, can, we, can we create a narrative that we're living in the same world. For example, if you're living in India, in a holy pilgrimage place, there are people living in that uh, town who are pickpockets and thieves. And they find that the distraction of pilgrims helps them to steal things. The holiness of the place for them is a help in their thieving activity. They have a particular vision, the pilgrim has another. The pilgrim is going down the road looking at the temples and the hill, and the pickpocket is looking at the necklaces around the women's necks and the bags that are open. When you observe how the world is operating, you see, oh, this is, this is each person's karmic vision. So, if we take birth in a pure land like uh, Sukhavati, the land of happiness, <laughs> that's a place where everything is easy. Now, if you have a materialist view, you say, oh, that's just another deceptive fantasy. This one life is all we have. But when we truly look at our experience, it is an illusion. No matter what identity we create for ourselves, it's never the whole story. All that we imagine is the creativity of the open ground. That's why being in a pure land is helpful because from there to open to the Absolute, the Dharma Datu, the single letter R, is uh, not so difficult. Whereas in our world, where things seem to be strongly real, the idea that um, the ground or basis is uh, an ungraspable open emptiness seems almost ridiculous. Ideas determine experience. We see many countries are turning uh, to in a more right-wing direction. The right-wing always brings a lot of polarization, as does extreme left-wing positioning. We are right, they are wrong, or we should kill the enemy. We have a lot of history of that. But when we look in the middle way, we have the paradoxical clarity, okay, the paradoxical clarity of seeing that the truth of things is their ungraspability. Clarity of definition, this is the only way, this is the one truth. This is uh, very attractive, very seductive, but it's a kind of stupidity. Once you take up a position, you limit yourself. The great, uh, sadly dead, Dzogchen teacher Namkai Norbu said again and again, do not limit yourself. What is a limit? It's a, a marker that says on the one side there is this, on the other side there is that. 
if I'm this, I'm not that. If I belong in this group, I don't belong in that group. Now, this doesn't mean that you cannot have uh, a very uh, precise discernment. Uh, I want to make a distinction here between discernment, which would be the appreciation of the price form, the precise formation of an event uh, and its its uh, impact on us, and differentiation in which we attribute some essential separative quality in each thing. In the tantric system, the purification of desire is the uh, wisdom of discernment, the original knowing or the uncontrived knowing which reveals each moment, each event just as it is. When we have desire, we tend to see one thing or one person or one place as being more important than others. If I only had this, I would be happy. If I only didn't have this, I wouldn't be unhappy. So we're perceiving some special qualities which seem to be inherent in the object. But yesterday we were looking at how this differentiation of the, let's say, things or objects that we experience, the appearances that we turn into objects, these objects are revealed to us as transient moments. The appearance goes and what remains is the concept. So <clears throat> the purification of desire is to not reify, not to conceptualize, but to stay with the immediate aesthetic revelation in all its wonderful detail. And this is the quality of the Pure Land. In the text it says, well, if you're going to be born in the Pure Land of the Buddha Amitabha, uh, you're born inside a lotus. If uh, you are ready, if you have uh, freed yourself from your limitations, then the lotus opens. But if uh, you still have some uh, traces and some obscuration. You sit inside the closed lotus flower, but you can hear the, the Dharma teaching that spreads through the air like music, and then gradually you become purified and ripened. Well, we, we can also take that as an image of our possibility in this life. When we are muffled, when we are inside the, the flower or the cocoon of our self-reference, we don't hear the music of the Dharma directly. And so we struggle to make sense of it. And to do that, we add our own concepts. So that's why if we do a tantric practice, we believe, oh, everything is the pure body of the deity. All sound is mantra. And because it's mantra, because it is pure, it's simply sound and emptiness, there is no, there is no need to interpret it or project any additional meaning into it. Because in fact, the pure land is always here with us. Purity is intrinsic. Impurity or obscuration or confusion is adventitious it arrives it has a beginning so if we if we really reflect and we can see that this is clear then we understand uh, the sadness and the difficulty of the human situation we spend our time trying to make things clear trying to work out how we should live, what we should do, what things mean. And we don't recognize that we are caught up 
in just what the Buddha said. Buddha said, all sentient beings want to be happy, but everywhere they go, they do things which don't bring them enduring happiness. So what we do in search of happiness is to try hard, to think more, to build up more information. And in doing this, we don't recognize that we are actually covering the innate purity and brilliance of what is here. The last thing our world needs is more concepts. We know what it's like to be out in nature, maybe walking on a beautiful hill. The colors, the shapes hold our attention. This is enough. We find a simplicity in how nature is. And by connecting with that, we find a simplicity in ourselves. Doing less, we receive more. Doing more, we receive less. That's a very simple principle. Unnecessary busyness is unhelpful. So oh, let's return to the text. So he says, now he's going to shift from um, this, uh, the unborn nature of everything to more specifically looking at the mind. How does our mind uh, abide as the ultimate inseparability of the two truths? So he's saying, when the two truths are applied to the single mind itself, this is only the use of names and signs. It is nothing more than conventional identification. So this is something you can uh, see for yourself. You see how you name things in the world. We each have our mother tongue. Then we learn perhaps other languages. And we see that other people use different words for the same object. The fusion between the name or sign and the object is uh, put into question by having different languages available. The name does not take you to what it refers to. The, referee, the referrer and the referent have a particular relationship as both being mind. If I say with some confidence, this is a tree, you don't say that in German or Italian or Spanish. Tree doesn't take me into the object the word tree takes me to the, the image of tree, the concept of tree. That is to say, it takes me to the mind. The tree is my experience. I cannot encounter the tree as an object. I can think of the tree as an object. My mode of conceptualization transforms everything into either subject or object. But what all that I can actually receive is experience. So just imagine you're walking towards a, a big tree. As you get closer, you see more details about the bark of the tree, the pattern of the leaves. You touch the bark. Really? Seems obvious, I'm touching the bark. I can feel the bark. But what you feel is sensation in your fingers. I bring my nose close, I smell the tree. I smell the uh, scent as revealed as experience. I lick the bark of the tree. I taste taste. I taste the sensation of taste in my mouth. 
I tell myself, oh, I'm tasting the tree. That is a narrative, a conceptual interpretation. You close your eyes. Run your tongue slowly up the bark of the tree. What is emerging is ungraspable. It is undeniable that there is occurrence. But what is it? If you apply your interpretation, the bark of this tree is rough, the taste is a little bitter, and so on, you are telling yourself about the tree. What is the naked revelation of the taste? It is just this. You know, it is revealed for you, and it's not a thing. It is, it is appearance and emptiness, undeniable and ungraspable. When you bring it into language, when you conceptualize it, you create something else. Both registers are valid. As human beings, we communicate through language, we have learned to many different concepts and words, and we know how to move these around and apply them. This is our impure relative truth. Because if my tongue is going up the bark, and I think, oh, this is very bitter. I already have my interpretive uh, matrix ready which reassures me, yes, bitter is not very pleasant. Don't lick it anymore. Thus, as we look yesterday, as soon as we establish the object, we have liking and not liking leading to different emotional responses uh, according to the five poisons. <clears throat> so, and that's an example. <clears throat> about uh, something, as it were, outer. But hopefully you can see this uh, clarifies everything is experience. You have, you only have access to experience. It is your experience, but that doesn't seal you in something narrow because experience arises co-emergent with this uh, interaction. So then, uh, if we're clear, I am living with and as the unfolding of experience. All that I say about experience is only conventional identification. So then he says, the ground, all-encompassing space, is without conceptual mind, and so the two truths are without foundation. So, if I'm open to a sound without interpreting it, or I, if I'm directly present with the revelation of the taste when my tongue is on the bark, there is no mediating mental activity using signs and concepts and associations and memories. It is just this. What is this? No one can say. The Buddhas can't say. So <clears throat> it's said in the text that uh, when, the, when the Buddha died, he said, I've shown you the way. You have to follow it. You have to awaken for yourself. You can get blessings from a place. You can get blessings from meditators and so on. These are experiences. But only you yourself can awaken to the unborn nature of experience. The, if you like, the knower or the, rather the, the, uh, presence of knowing or awareness is unborn and empty. And what is 
known or revealed or appearing is unborn appearance. The unborn and the unborn are together. And so he said, <coughs> excuse me. And so he says, the two truths are without foundation. They have never, ever been separate. So if you, <clears throat> if you are in a place where the sky is open and you're looking at the open sky <clears throat> and you're really open to it, then your mind becomes like the sky. So this we can experience with the, the sky gazing practice. And if you're looking at the sky and the cloud appears, it's as if your open presence inseparable from the sky falls into the cloud. And now you're focused on the shape of the cloud. And it is as if the sky is non-existent, but the cloud is an existent. So you can think about what the cloud looks like, or perhaps it means rain is coming. But the cloud is in the sky. The cloud is the showing of the sky. It is within the sky, but it is as if your conceptualization of the cloud takes it out of the sky and makes it something separate. It's the same with the reflection in the mirror. For example, you can put a mirror up and put some neutral object outside. You see the reflection. It's some shape in the mirror. Then you move over and you look into the mirror yourself. <clears throat> oh, <clears throat> you have a strong recognition. This is my face. And this recognition brings the shape of your embodiment into the foreground as figure and the rest is in, in the background and unattended to. You have fallen into the reflection and that falling into it or merging with it or giving attention to it makes it something which seems to take it out of the mirror. So if you hold these two examples in mind, and you reflect on your own experience of meditation, then <clears throat> you can recall that you're sitting with your practice, maybe relaxed and open, and something occurs, and you fall into it. You're distracted, you're carried into wherever this thought formation is going. The thought has arisen in your mind. It hasn't come from anywhere else. And yet, in the intensity of your lock on to the thought, your open awareness collapses into a dualistic uh, focus on an object. This is very interesting. You have gone somewhere without going anywhere. It is as if I'm lost and distracted. The thought has taken me away from the open mind. But the reason that the thought can move is because the mind is open. All thoughts, memories, plans, sensations are inseparable from the mind. You don't go anywhere else. Well, this is the central understanding. From the very beginning, there has only ever been here and now. Here and now, it has many different names in the Buddhist tradition. One is the Dharma Dhatu, the space of all phenomena. Here can be very, very small or it can be as bigger than the whole universe. Within the delusion of duality, I think I'm here inside this body, in this room. 
and then can go from this room into the kitchen. Then I will be somewhere else. This is what he means. The world as uh, conditioned or cooked or prepared by conventional signs. But I'm here. If I get up and I move out towards the door to go to the kitchen, at each moment, I'm here. Always here. Always now. I don't, can't be in the past. Past is gone. <clears throat> the future hasn't come. <clears throat> there is only here and now. Here and now is like the sky. Sometimes it's clear, sometimes it's cloudy. When here and now is cloudy, that's when I think I'm somewhere else. <clears throat> I think I'm somewhere else. That's a cloud. The cloud is in the sky. The thought, oh, I was distracted, is here but I hear it mediated through believing that the concept is telling me about something else. That is a concept. So this is what he's saying. He said the ground of all encompassing space, that is the here and now openness, everything that occurs is only ever just this. And he says, this is without the conceptual mind. What this means is you don't have to get rid of the conceptual mind. When you see that the conceptual mind is inseparable from the mind itself, which is open and unborn and uncontaminated, unmarked, then all the activity of the conceptual mind is just like a dream factory. Nothing is created. If you watch a horror movie, you may well feel afraid because you believe in the structure of the film and it seems to be true. Although conceptually you know it's an illusion, because of the skill of the filmmaker your, and your own karmic tendency, you're pulled into a belief in the, let's call it reality of what is occurring, the fear arises from your delusion. Illusion is uh, something which is there, but not truly there. It's, it's uh, just about clear. It's, you can get it it's it's not it's like water you something's there but you can see through it but if you add uh, some uh, dark color into the water then you it becomes uh, opaque you can't see through it it is thickened Say you took some grains of instant coffee and stirred them into the water. The, the color would go from light brown to dark brown to almost black. This gives a more of a thickness to what is in the glass. So the coffee is your belief. It is your own belief in the horror movie that makes it scary your belief, your willingness to surrender yourself into the flow of the story thickens the illusory nature of the movie into a seeming reality, and that is delusion. You are frightening yourself. There is nothing there. This is a film, it's just the colors, lights, and words which are just sound. Appearance and emptiness, sound and emptiness, 
and yet we still want to look away because it's too horrible. Your own mental dullness is revealed daily. I believe things to be real when they are not real. The problem doesn't lie in the things which are appearances. The problem lies with my belief, my willingness to imagine that things are separate real entities. So what he's saying is that the absolute and the relative are not two different things. When they are co-present, then the illusory form remains illusion, like a dreamlike clarity. But if you fall into the illusion and believe it to be real, it will be a delusion and you will get lost. So he's saying the ground of all this experience is the Dharma Datu, the, the space within which everything occurs, the unborn space of unborn appearances. And he says, if you see this, then the result is the, you have the same understanding or insight as the Buddha. And this is without conceptual mind. Now, again, we have to uh, we have to be clear what the word without means. It doesn't mean that there is no conceptual mind at all. It means that the conceptual mind doesn't touch the open mind itself. If without the conceptual mind, we wouldn't have any connectivity. Sometimes when I was in India a long time ago, I would go to see, when I was first there, I would go to see Lamas. They didn't know any English. I didn't know any Tibetan. So we look at each other and smile. That was very nice. But I didn't learn any Dharma that way. I learned a little bit of Tibetan and other people could translate for me. And so I started to learn the meaning of the text. That is to say, for human beings, most of us need some kind of conceptual transmission. So in the Dzogchen tradition, we have the, the first level of transmission is direct mind to mind for the Buddhas. And the second is the symbolic transmission, which is the, the transmission of the, the great yogis, the Rigsins, the Vidyadhara enlightened ones. But then we have the third level of transmission, which is through the ear hole of human beings. So this at first appeared as uh, Garab Dorji saying his famous three statements, which were received by Manjushri Mitra. If uh, Garab Dorji hadn't spoken, most of us wouldn't understand anything. In terms of this world, compassion involves connectivity and language is a mode of connectivity. The key issue is to become aware that language is not different from emptiness. As some of us have looked many times, we go from the breath to ah, to mama, papa, and all the words spread from this. In the sky, the wind blows, and so the tree, the leaves in the tree shake. In the space of the lungs and the throat and the mouth, the wind, the breath arises and goes into vibration. And so these sounds come out, which we interpret as words. This is the sound of emptiness. This sound is the equivalent of a mirage. It is an illusion. We add the concepts, the instant coffee grains, and the words become opaque and dense and carry real meaning. 
So if someone says, I love you, this brings a particular feeling. And I hate you brings a very different feeling. This is the density of sound merged with concept. So the, uh, the mind itself is not touched by concepts, but it allows the movement of concepts. Otherwise, there would be no connectivity. So we can have the connectivity of the pure relative truth, where we are simply open and we respond to the situation of other people. That is to say, I'm relaxed and open. I don't really need anything from you. But what I would like for you is that you are relaxed and open. So we don't block or limit other people. But we offer them a hospitality that allows them to find their own integration in emptiness. Whereas in impure relative truth, <clears throat> we have appearance and attachment. So I'm attached to myself. I want to be happy. I like you, so I want you. I don't like you, so I don't want you. So I move through the world selecting, adopting some things, rejecting others. My basic agenda is self-preservation and uh, creating the conditions for my own happiness. This arises on the basis of the concept of my ego self. I exist. But when we look for the self, we don't find it. Our body is a system of communication inside the skin and also through the skin and through the sense organs. It's not a thing. So again and again, when complex patterns of experience arise, these are clouds. Sometimes we live in clouds for days or months or even years. The, the main problem is not the cloud, but the interpretation that says, I am depressed, I am hopeless. That is a construct, uh, a conclusion. <clears throat> there is cloud. There is sadness. There is sadness. Sadness is a flavor of my life. A poignancy. Uh, a kind of slight sinking into myself an unavailability I can't be bothered a turning away these are all movements of the mind there is no need for any conclusion about them if you, if you stay with the dynamism of the patterning of experience, you find it is inseparable from the mind. Inseparable from the mind doesn't mean merged into the mind. It means inseparable from the mind, the way the reflection is inseparable from the mirror. The reflection cannot harm or limit or defile the mirror. So when you sit in the meditation practice, if your mind is dull, you seem to be just lost in thought. Don't think about this. Don't judge it. Simply be present with what is occurring. Now, we talk about infinite hospitality as a way of thinking of the Dharma Dhat. But our ego doesn't offer infinite hospitality. It, it offers big hospitality to nice, bright, shiny, happy things. And that could include uh, depressive thoughts. Because you might enjoy being sad. 
and the ego rejects or doesn't want things which are uh, dystonic or uh, out of harmony with its sense of identity. So, again and again, we go, have to go back to the five questions. Until you are very clear that your mind is unborn, then the tendency to identify as a thing, as a person, as a limited unit will occur. The mind is like the sky. All kinds of weather come through. The weather is not the sky. So the meditation instruction says, whatever comes, comes. Don't edit, don't interfere, don't construct. Otherwise, you just have the artifice of the self-defending ego. So that's why the basic meditation we do is the Guru Yoga. Relaxing into the sound of ah, we release our preoccupations, our habit formations. We can't get rid of them, but we can release our identification with them. Just as if you decide to stop smoking cigarettes, that doesn't remove all the cigarettes in the world. You sit maybe in a cafe and someone's smoking. You could have a cigarette, but you don't smoke. Smoke is there, cigarettes are there, but you don't smoke. If you imagine that you're going to have a mind that will never ever have troubling thoughts, any kind of difficulty, that would be very strange. Part of how we relate to other people is our empathic attunement. That is to say, we know what it's like to get involved, to be lost in a habit formation, but we relax our identification with it. You're sitting at a small table in the cafe with a friend, they're smoking a cigarette. Yeah, that's what's happening. It's happening in the space. If a thought arises in me, oh, I would like to smoke. It has no traction. The thought of smoking a cigarette cannot hook the habit of smoking because the thought of having a cigarette is an illusory appearance, an appearance and emptiness. And the habit of smoking, the residue or the echo of the habit of smoking is also an appearance inseparable from emptiness. The power of the habit is the power of belief. Just as with the horror movie, the illusion is turned into delusion by our belief. So again and again, we should open to the space of appearances subject moving in space, object moving in space, everything is just this, here and now. Okay, so now we take a, a break, say 25 minutes. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs> Okay, so now we continue with the text. It says, although the minds of bewildered sentient beings are clarity and emptiness, they do not recognize this. That is to say, like the glass of clear water, the mind is clear, but we add delusion. We add projections, interpretations, and so on. And we do this in an attempt to clarify the clear water. This is the great sadness of life. So uh, then he says, uh, by abiding in the clarity and emptiness of awareness, the inseparability of the two truths is actualized. The clarity here means that you see that appearances are like a dream, like the reflection of the moon on water. They have no intrinsic substance. 
they are empty, yet they appear. And this is the quality of awareness. Awareness or rigpa is not a thing. It's not something that you have or you could lose. It's the uh, intrinsic illumination of the mind. It's the, it's the, if, if you like, you could also say it's life. It's, it's our being alive, being present. It's the basis of experience. So then he repeats that although the, these two truths, the, the ultimate or the absolute and the relative are inseparable, for the sake of practice, we uh, deal with them separately. So we need to attend to everything we experience through our senses, all appearances, and see their illusory nature. You, this means you have to observe how you add the thickening uh, function of conceptualization. Now, we have to conceptualize. The, the issue is, as you add the instant coffee powder to the water, you have to see what you're doing. I am thickening this. I am inventing this. I'm constructing this. So, why am I doing it? There are two main uh, reasons. <clears throat> The first is the samsaric intention to maintain my sense of self. And the, the second is uh, bodhicitta, or the orientation towards awakening, which is, I do this for the sake of connecting with others. It is as if it is real. And I adopt this position because people around me believe it to be real. I know it's not real, <clears throat> but if I say that to other people, it will alienate them. We can only help people be available in a useful way if we connect with people. So we have to uh, adopt the mode of connectivity that's present there. So we have descriptions of the Buddhas of the six realms when they're among the, the Buddha who goes to the sensual God realm, he plays music because they like music. And the Buddha in the hot hell brings cooling water. And the Buddha in the cold hells brings blankets. <clears throat> because they're, they're concerned to connect with the people. So if we understand this, then we take on a particular shape or coloring or tonal quality in order to promote the connectivity. So then he says, in this way, the non-interpretive as it isness of knowledge and the non-interpretive as it isness of the knower are merged inseparably with one flavor. This is simply the simplicity of things. It is amazing that since Dharma is about simplicity, it has so many complex, difficult technical terms. Now, when you come across these uh, technical terms, you should think of them as the styles of massage. Some are like rolfing, which are very deep and painful. And some are very sweet and gentle, like aromatherapy. The purpose of the massage is to release us from tension. But if you take the technical term up as something to think about, but what does it really mean? It means that there is no end to the possibilities of creativity. That's all. So in more simple language, the sentence is simply saying, the unborn emptiness of what is known, the object, and the unborn emptiness of the knower are not different. Thus, all phenomena and beings are just emptiness, 
And so all outer and inner phenomena are free of the interpretations of being and non-being, permanence and oblivion, and so are uncompounded like the sky. This sentence is like um, having a bowl of some delicious soup. You can't get any more of the soup out with your spoon. So you put in a piece of bread and move it around and soak up the last drops of soup. So saying whatever kind of entities or phenomena as real you can imagine, they are all empty and they are not like this, they're not like that, whether you say existing or non-existing, permanent, impermanent, whatever terms you might believe in, nothing is born, everything is empty. If you don't add the coffee grains, everything is clear, uncompounded like the sky, not put together, not created, not a product. So he's on the basis of this, he says, experiencing that there is no seer, no one who sees and nothing to be seen, no thinker and nothing to be thought, then there is clear vision and non-deceptive understanding. So the mind is relaxed and open. The senses are unblocked. Not holding the mind inside, not keeping the world outside. There is undivided or non-dual experience. No polarization into the one who sees and what is seen, the one who thinks and what is thought. If we do this, there is clear vision and non-deceptive understanding. Now, this is difficult as a practice, although it, although it should be simple. What makes it difficult is anxiety. We all remember being small and having to learn things that were difficult to tie our shoelaces and to learn the alphabet and things are easy for some people, but for many is very difficult. I don't understand. And when we're trying to learn something, there's a kind of dip in our intelligence because we are in a state where we don't know. And so knowing seems to be better than not knowing. If there is knowing, then you pass your exams and people applaud you. If, if you don't know, then people are more uh, doubting about your capacity. So these background uh, egoic experiences hover and shimmer as ensnaring traces. Because the essential encouragement here is to trust the intrinsic. The mind is not made by good deeds. It's not spoiled by uh, confusion and negative activity. It just is. Can we relax and release? So the ego shadow says, yes, but do you understand? Oh, what's going on? What's happening? I need to know. And so we can have the mobilization into unnecessary activity. So we have to be aware of these tendencies. If I construct it, it may be functional, but it will not be intrinsic or authentic. If I want you to like me, and so I talk to you in a way that I have learned that you will like. And then I find that you like me. Well, the one that you like is the one I have created that I know will be likable by you. You like my inauthentic self, but probably you won't like my authentic self. Because my authentic self is willing to lie to you and cheat you in order to get you to like me. In the Dharma, there's a lot of 
uh, encouragement, don't be artificial, don't compound, don't build, don't falsify. Stay with the simplicity of how it is. So, now he's moving on to the second part of this uh, explanation, which is the dharmas of practice or the, the, the ways in which we can practice to make this come alive in us. And there are two ways of practice. So he says, uh, if you have accumulated a lot of karma in previous lives and developed wisdom on the basis of practice, then uh, you can uh, find a way into direct or immediate awakening. He says, those fortunate ones will spontaneously understand on just hearing the teaching of the two truths and will be able to remain in that state of uh, direct experience. <clears throat> and he says, moreover, in meditation, they will abide in the sky-like state of the two truths free of interpretation, in which both knowledge and knower are empty and devoid of self-substance. What this means is, you trust, my mind is open. Sometimes no clouds, sometimes light fluffy clouds, sometimes storm clouds. All are welcome. They come and they go and they don't define who I am. So he says for, for people like that, meditating, there are no bad thoughts to be cleared away and no good thoughts that should be relied on. Now, this is easy to say, but difficult. It's not difficult for open awareness because this is how awareness is but it's difficult for the ego self because as we know a negative thought is not something that we have like a, a rotten apple in the kitchen it's filling me i am suffused with this negative thought so if i'm not very balanced if i tip into identification with the thought and I'm doing this from my egoic point of view. I don't like this thought. I don't want this thought. What's the point of meditating if it simply gives me negative thoughts? So then we are likely to go into reactivity. Again and again, awareness is inclusive. The ego self, our dualistic consciousness is exclusive. So this is like a little litmus test. If you're getting into opinions and uh, excitement or sadness, and it feels like you, from the point of view of uh, true practice, don't change anything. It doesn't feel pleasant, but it is empty of substance, it is not harmful if you leave it alone. If you get involved with it, it will cause you trouble. But we want to do something. The impulse is to get rid of the negative and get the positive. So this is, this is why we study the view with this familiar example, when you're a child and you've uh, got some little uh, irritate, scratch or irritation, you it becomes itchy and you want to scratch at it. Your mother says, eh, don't scratch it, it'll make it worse. But it doesn't feel that that's true. I just need to do it. It, it seems obvious you have to scratch. So this is the state of the ego in relation to something that it likes, it wants more, it doesn't like, it wants less. It's a very quick impulsive reaction. So this is why he's saying in terms of relative truth, you have to observe your own habits and tendencies. So for example, if you're going shopping and you see something you really would like, maybe some nice uh, top, some nice dress or something. 
You can pick it up and look at it and even try it on. But I don't need it. I would like it. I don't need it. So I'll leave it there. But I like it. I want it. Life would be better with it. Why am I depriving myself? I don't need it. Then you, then you feel that urge. Ooh, the answer lies in the object. If only I had that. I am incomplete. That dress, that partner, that bar of chocolate, I need it to make me feel okay. But our practice is in this family of Dzogchen. The great completion. The always already complete. So if it's always already complete, what is the status of this need? It's a delusion. The delusion tells me I need something I don't need. So the more you explore this with outer objects in the world, you, you can start to catch it more quickly in your meditation, where you go after thoughts and feelings and so on, which you don't need. Now, if you bought a nice dress, you could bring it home and try it on and show your friends. But when you're sitting in the meditation practice and a nice or pleasing thought arises, you can't take it out of the shop. It just dissolves. This thought that you go after vanishes. It's a mirage. But I want it. It's not even a conscious thought that I want it. I just move towards it. Now, this is not a sign that you're a bad meditator or you're distracted. This is a sign of non-duality. There is no uh, barrier between the cloud and the sky. There is no barrier between the reflection and the mirror. And no barrier between the thought and your mind. It's not coming from outside, pressing the doorbell, may I come in? It's instantly in. So don't try to keep it outside. The instruction is always, whatever comes, comes. Whatever goes, goes. If it comes, it will definitely go. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Not leave it alone like leave it out there. It's already in here. This feeling that fills you is not you. So in the teaching, sometimes we have the example of a crystal ball. And when you put it on red cloth, it looks a bit red. You put it on blue cloth, it looks a bit blue. Actually, the crystal ball is always clear. <clears throat> it only seems to have that color. So the, cle the, the more you are uh, present in the clarity of your mind, like this crystal ball, it's not blocking anything. The red light or the, the happy thought or the blue light or the sad thought is here in me, as me, but not touching me, not defining me, not defining me. So <clears throat> he then quotes uh, Maitreya, the, the future Buddha, who, who transmitted this to Asanga. It says, in this there is nothing to clear away and not the least thing to be kept. The Dharmakaya, the mind itself, is complete from the very beginning. It's not improved by what are taken to be good thoughts or feelings, and it's not uh, defiled or damaged by what are taken to be negative thoughts or feelings. And he says, by clearly looking at actuality, at how it is in itself, without you altering it, 
when you truly see, you will be completely free. So, you look at the crystal ball, it's on the red cloth. You can see that it is clear, yet it is as if it looks red. The clarity hosts the illusion of the redness. Then you don't need to get rid of the illusion because the illusion is non-dual with the empty clarity. It's not spoiling it. It's not adding or subtracting anything. So if you, if you see, oh, it's open and empty, then he says, you will be completely free. The ego is a helpless puppet. The ego self has many strings. The occurrences of life grab our strings and pull them and we twitch and respond. The mind itself has no strings. Whatever comes, comes. It comes and goes. But for the ego self, this is coming to me. Do I like it or not like it? So this is what we have to uh, become clear of. We have to cut these puppet strings. We have to see the emptiness of the provocations that come from other people. We have to see the emptiness of our own habitual reactivity. So he then says, having practiced in that way for all manner of appearances, like you keep practicing it in all situations, with a sitting in practice, on your own, with friends, with people who are difficult. Then we see that appearance is devoid of inherent self-existence. And one maintains the dreamlike state of the union of the two truths. So, if you read the stories of uh, yogis, they often uh, are in difficult situations. They're cold or hungry, or they might have lice in their long matted hair, or be in a situation where insects, ants are biting them, or mosquitoes, and they're just sitting. This is not an ascetic practice. They're not trying to punish the body or become able to resist everything. Rather, they, they're relaxing out of reactivity to the stimulus which is coming from these situations. So in the text we read, that which imprisons ordinary people frees the yogi. So if you're sitting and mosquitoes are coming and drinking your blood, mostly people want to get rid of the mosquito. They don't want this to happen. The mosquitoes are interfering with the person's sense of themselves and it's an interruption. But here, it's just something. There's the outer appearance of the mosquito, the buzzing noise, the, the thought arises, oh God, they're going to be uh, hurting me, putting in their uh, proboscis, and then they'll be taking blood. Maybe I'll get a disease. All of these arise as illusory forms. Without effort, by open, by opening to the emptiness of appearance, there is no suffering. Well, in this, that doesn't mean there isn't pain, but there is, no, there is no one, no ego self who is suffering. So there is no reification, no solidification of the experience, and so no judgment about it. So then he says, as regards those dreamlike, illusory sentient beings who do not understand this, with an illusory, loving, and compassionate, enlightened attitude, 
gather the illusory accumulation of merit and wisdom for the sake of all beings. The more we uh, open to wisdom or the intrinsic clarity of the mind, and we have this sense of not being uh, impacted, uh, truly impacted by events, we need to balance this by opening ourselves to the state of illusory sentient beings and doing our best to uh, allow the energy of awareness to act for their benefit. And that's why if you're doing this practice, you can help to build stupas or whitewash stupas, or, uh, create satsa figures, you can uh, create and fill wealth jars and plant them in the earth in order to rebalance the five elements, burn butter lamps and uh, say many prayers for the benefit of others. As he says, make a vast aspiration to benefit sentient beings. There is no contradiction between the two. Say wisdom and compassion are like two wings of a bird. They function together just as absolute truth and relative truth are co-present. Because when we see that the mind has no limit, we go from the inclusivity of our self-concern, sorry, we go from the uh, exclusivity of our inward-looking self-concern to developing are resting in the Dharma Datu as the space of all phenomena and thereby inclusively offering hospitality to all. Opening is not the standing apart, it is the space of spontaneous participation. So then, he, <clears throat> sorry, so then he says, if this direct immediate path is too far away from you or not available as a direct experience for you, or sometimes you're open to it and sometimes you're not, then you should start with the four reflections that turn the mind from samsara. These are described in many texts, the precious human existence, impermanence and death, suffering in samsara, and karma <clears throat> and for, especially for the western people these are very very important the world is not a fixed material thing the world is experience our, our experience arises from karma on the basis of duality this is the foundation of all the styles of practice because if the materialistic vision is true and we are going to vanish at death with no nothing no mental trace no experiential trace then why bother now as we've been looking this idea that the world is experience is not a, a belief that we are imposing on uh, what occurs for us, but it is what will be clear if we really attend to the nature of experience. And he says, then you should pro you can progress through the various stages of practice. And he says, if you do not do this, then you will gain only a general understanding of the profound truth. Because what we need is a paradigm shift. We want to shift from thinking about what is going on, interpreting what is going on, to a direct, immediate, non-conceptual opening to how it is. So then he says, all thoughts and appearances, however they are, are relative. All the Dharma teachings are relative. The truth cannot be said. Prajnaparamita, the mother of all the Buddhas, is beyond speech, thought, and expression. 
So although we study Dharma, we're not doing it to become Buddhist. Buddhist is just another relative term. If you learn lots of things about the qualities of uh, Tara, or uh, you learn Madhyamika philosophy, these are all ideas operating within the realm of relative truth. No knowledge about anything will take me to awakening. Moreover, it's not about knowing who I am. That's another form of relative knowing. <clears throat> it's not about knowing about our mind. It's about opening to the unborn presence of awareness, which is non-dual with all experience. So he says, being awake to how they, the thoughts and appearances actually are, is the absolute. Okay, it was the next, it, it begin, the paragraph begins all thoughts and appearances. It's the second sentence. No, no, that's the third. The sec well, in English, the second, yeah. So again, he's, he's <clears throat> saying, if, <clears throat> if you see the empty or unborn nature of all phenomena, that they have no true existence of their own, this is itself the, uh, the uh, absolute. Now, there is a grammatical problem with the translation of these lines here. Because the absolute cannot be found as an object. But the verbs that we use, meaning to understand, to know, uh, to have insight into, even to awaken to, all indicate in the normal usage, some kind of dualistic relationship. So we have to read with uh, a clarity regarding the nature of language. So then he says, the intellect that understands that, that understands that, that everything is inseparable from the uh, absolute. That is relative. <clears throat> that is relative. That is to say, any reliance on dualistic conceptualization cannot bring you to the absolute. Although it, in, although all forms of uh, conceptualization are inseparable in themselves from the absolute. So he says. The lack of inherent existence in the intellect is the absolute. That is to say, as we are studying this together, we are applying our intellect, our intellectual capacity. This intellectual capacity helps us to uh, get some conceptual understanding of what is going on. But this intellect, this quality of the mind can be misunderstood as a quality of myself. Wow, I am a smart guy. I can understand this strange Eastern stuff. Lucky me. This is stupidity. Because the intellect is itself like a if awareness is the sun, then the intellect is like a, a ray of bright light that illuminates. The actual nature of the intellect is empty. It is the brightness of the mind. It's not a quality that I, ego self, have. So he's, this is what he says. The lack of inherent self-existence in the intellect, that is to say, your intelligence is not a thing that you have. You don't exist as a haver, an owner, a possessor, and your intellect is not a quality of you. 
the intellect is unborn and this is it ident this is its non difference from the absolute there is no self everything is the radiance of the mind and the mind is not a thing the sound that expresses the two truths is relative while the lack of inherent self nature in that sound is the absolute so the sound that's coming out of my mouth is organized to create a, a vehicle for the words and concepts in the english language i'm talking to you about dharma this is dualistic relative truth but as the sound comes out of my mouth sound we can take that as the word sound and we know what sound refers to that is an interpretation linked on to sound this is a composite a compound an illusory substance the concept of sound added to the sound of sound this creates the illusion that the word is in itself meaningful if it was meaningful inherently then the kind work of our three translators would not be required because language is conventional you have to have access to the conventions necessary to uh, identify the meaning of the signs empty sound linked with, linked with concept becomes a vehicle for linking patterns of meaning to create the narratives within which we move so in the guru yoga we go ah <clears throat> this sound is really nothing at all it's just vibration it's the first light of dawn of the world of things it provides a vehicle for building up all the words but in the guru yoga we're going in the other direction we're using art to deconstruct the edifice of conceptual identity so <clears throat> sound the word which we are, can understand is simultaneously sound inside our usual dualistic interpretive stance we tilt towards the cognitive interpretation of sound so, so when we have this long open r we are taking all concepts and their supportive words and allowing them to dissolve into their root cars houses car so if you take a word and you can do this it's a very helpful exercise take any word that is, <clears throat> has immediately a, a concrete meaning for you and allow the sound to stretch out at a certain point the sound is just sound and you can't catch it as a basis for concept so we have space wind seeming seeming solidification and with the concept applied to this form of the wind we have somehow a support for continued uh, words and the generation of meaning so again this is not an either or it's not saying the absolute is good and the relative is bad what he's saying is 
if you make these two oppositional, mutually exclusive categories, then you become very troubled. There is no true existence in the relative, and so it does not stand in opposition to the absolute. And therefore, everything is like a dream. It is experience, yes, impactful experience, but this experience is not resting on any internal essence of uh, self-existence. It arises co-emergent with the other factors in the field. Everything is arising together. This is the Dharma Datu. As we've looked, uh, Datu means a space within, within which there are the dharmas, dharma here means phenomena, or that which occurs. But these uh, phenomena are not in the dharma datu, the way that currents are in a fruitcake. They are emerging in one field. This in, in uh, Soksha, we talk of hlundru, everything arises at once. The field, the field of occurrence is an all at onceness, which is then seemingly chopped up by our conceptualization into a world of things. But if I say car, one word is never enough. We have to say my car, your car, red car. Words have meaning through their relationship. All phenomena have meaning due to their relationship. There are no isolated entities. The world is revealed as participative experience, which is unborn and unceasing. Okay, so uh, we take a break now for lunch. It's um, back at two o'clock, which means we have about uh, 54 minutes. Good. See you then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then maybe we continue with the text. So he's just summarizing it by saying the nature of knowledge and the Buddha's understanding are beyond perception as the union of the two truths. So Again, this is just another way of saying it's not a thing. You don't arrive anywhere. You don't get anywhere. But that's not a problem because you don't need anything. Every construct is bound to fall apart sooner or later. So this uncompounded is the reliable, the unchanging. And this is the all-encompassing space free of interpretation or beyond any interpretation. Within it, there are neither beings nor phenomena having inherent existence. So when we read things like this, it's very important to apply them to your own life. My mother, my mother doesn't exist. If your mother is still alive, you can meet her, talk with her. She's your mom. She, you know, she's there. She's, that's how she is. But she doesn't exist as something. You will never know your mother. She's had all kinds of conversations and qualities of relationships with different people. You don't know this. We are not objects of knowledge. We are the site of the infinite potential of patterning. It's very unlikely that how your mother is with you is the same as how she is with her friends. You could imagine your mother is a, a great crystal form with a thousand facets. Each event she encounters turns her around and the different people she engage with 
have an aspect of herself, a facet revealed. It's not that she is hiding something from you, but our revelation is situational. We express ourselves according to the situation, the mood, how people are in themselves. Not, neither things nor people exist as entities. What we call what we call things are just phenomena, appearances in the world. They arise due to causes and conditions, they remain due to causes and conditions, and they vanish due to causes and conditions. So then he says to, to understand this, to open to this, to live in with this, this is the view. I am ungraspable. Everything I encounter is ungraspable. Therefore, I should, could release myself from the false habit of grasping. So then he says, to remain in that state is the meditation. So when we want to take hold of something, to define someone, to place them uh, inside a particular conceptualization, then it helps to see, oh, this is an activity. If I participate as subject onto object, then my mode of participation will reify and separate that which I'm participating with. So we relax in the out breath, we're just sitting. Many potential formations arise, patterns arise and pass. We don't need to be involved. Neither merging nor uh, pushing away, we start to see that we are the openness within which these experiences are occurring. The more we do this, we see the illusory, impermanent, self-vanishing nature of all occurrences. Then we don't need to protect ourselves against them. And gradually the ego formation, which is held in place by active involvement in what is occurring, starts to thin and disperse like a thin cloud vanishing back into the sky. The ego is a pattern of manifesting energy. It's not something we have to get rid of. It's, it's not a something, it's a patterning which is forming around a false belief. I exist. That's a, the kind of uh, kernel around which all these identifications of I, me, myself uh, develop. So then he says to compassionately benefit others with the accumulations and so on is the conduct. So in the practice, it says, um, we dedicate the merit of whatever we're doing for the benefit of others. We share with others because it belongs to everyone. Living in the shared field of experience, we participate in the common good. The Dharma Datu is the common ground. And because I am arising in relation with everything, my relationship is my uh, manifestation. Yes. So my, uh, my, how I arise is with the other. So self and other, or my experience of me and my experience of the environment are co-emergent. And so there's no basis for having a, a fixed boundary between myself and others. Common benefit from the beginning, neither martyrdom, sacrificing everything for the other, nor self-obsession and keeping everything for oneself, but sharing through participation. 
powerful. He says, to dissolve subject and object in intrinsic openness is the result. <clears throat> Fixing myself as being in here and other people as being out there is uh, a mental activity. When we do the three R and we open, what we take to be my experience of me and my body and my experience of the room and my experience of memories and plans all arise at once. They all arise together. So subject and object are transient patternings within the openness of my presence, my being here now. All pervading unbiased Original knowing is the quality. <clears throat> that is to say, because my participation is not turned around my uh, prefabricated sense of self, I'm not organizing experience in terms of what's important for me. And so we are attentive to everything. Nothing is special. Nothing is more important than anything else. Then finally, he says, the accomplishment of automatic benefit for beings is the activity. The benefit arises because there is no threshold between self and other. And so if there is a need or a request, we move automatically towards that or spontaneously towards that. But, but uh, there is a particular meaning in this uh, sentence. That is to say, <clears throat> in this openness, I don't have any agenda. I don't, I don't want to get you. I don't want to reject you. So I'm just open. How many times in our life do we meet anyone who is just open? We are coming with our shopping list, likes and dislikes. And, and this brings uh, a self-referential shaping onto the encounter. But if we can be just open, that allows the possibility of the person not to be confirmed in their belief that they know who they are. In life, um, particularly when you're young, it can be very important to have a teacher who believes in your potential, who, who sees something in you that perhaps your parents don't see. That allows uh, an opening of your uh, perspective. But this is rather different. This has no agenda or expectation. It's saying there's no choreography for this encounter coming from my side. So you might be able to uh, recognize the choreography coming from your side. That's the automatic benefit for beings. So it says, do not hold names and signs to be inherently meaningful. They are conventional, established in culture. And so then he says, know that names, words, and signs serve to demonstrate meaning. This is, means relative meaning uh, within duality. It doesn't mean the absolute meaning or the absolute truth. So the, this word demonstrate is, is more like um, manifesting, laying out in front of you, showing that if you rely on the word or the sign, you will arrive at the meaning established by the use of that sign. But because all names, words, and signs have no inherent meaning, they are without true existence. So he's, now he's going to say the same thing again and again, because actually you could write this whole text in about five sentences. And the reason he's repeating these things a few times, 
is because we have hundreds of thousands of times said, I am, I exist, I'm me, I want, I don't want. So this is a, a mild antidote to our delusion. The mind that understands appearances is without inherent existence. And so is said to be without substantial self, without being, without personhood, without performer. So what he's saying is the mind doesn't do anything. And yet a lot occurs. So when we use these examples like a rainbow or a mirage, these forms arise in dependent origination. On the basis of this, that arises. Neither this nor that have true existence. They are patternings of potential. So it's not that our mind, some kind of deep inner big self is somehow pumping out uh, our experience, but rather, Due to circumstances, different patterns emerge. For example, um, due to COVID, I started to do teachings on Zoom. Due to having met uh, Pedro and Joao and uh, Milton in Portugal, uh, we somehow developed a connection that allowed all these Zooms to come into being. The, the deep the potential was ripened by the conjunction of these meetings and forces it doesn't arise out of nothing at all but neither is it created by real things with a definitive intention it emerges as a patterning of illusory phenomena oh, the mind itself it's not a, a doer or a maker, an understander, but in its openness, it does not block the arising, the spontaneous arising of the patterns which it understands. And he emphasizes this by saying, and what is here said to be without inherent existence is truly without it. Words like self-existence are not normally used in our daily language. So they might not have too much meaning for us. If I say, I am just how I am. Implicit on the, in that formulation has implicit within it, from the Buddhist point of view, a notion of self-existence. Which is just me. And the Buddhist uh, critique of this would say, listen, without food, breath, education, and all of these things, your patterning wouldn't have the, the formations that it does. You don't come out of you. Now, if you go in the kitchen, you turn the tap and water comes out of the tap. So where does water come from? Oh, out of the tap. But, of course, it comes through the pipe, from the water pumping station, from the reservoir. So, if I say, I'm just me, then that's like saying, I'm a water tap. I'm coming out of me. But there are many, many pathways and forces which are feeding into resourcing how I manifest, including you, looking at the screen otherwise i wouldn't be talking like this so he's saying that uh, what is said to be without inherent existence uh, self-existence is truly the case nothing in your home is there by itself you have purchased it from places where it's made or prepared the choices you made uh, reflect your uh, aesthetic sensibility, your notion of uh, cultural values. We are all 
patterning the potential which is around us, whether that has to do with the kind of the color of paint you use to paint your walls, the kind of books you buy or whatever. And then he says, because there is no true or real existence, that is to say, things don't exist in and of themselves. Because of this, there is also no non-being or uh, no uh, without being. And this so-called being without is totally free of all being and non-being. And he says, these are only words. As we look before the lunch break, when we rely on concepts, on words to build up narratives, we can invest any patterning of words with meaning. This arises due to our particular situation. In this Tibetan system, the issue of being or non-being is very important. In the culture of my grandchild, uh, football is very important. Right now, when he has a bath, he wants to take his football into the bath so he can wash it and have it nice and clean. So, we invest words with meaning. This is our existential freedom. We can put meaning into invading other countries, into killing people, into uh, healing people. So this is, uh, from the point of view of ethics, this is something uh, very important. Nothing is pre-established. Everything can be invested with specific meaning. Often we are shocked when we encounter meanings which we can't believe people would make. Yesterday evening I was, I was reading a, a review of a report on human rights abuses in Colombia. And it reported how uh, someone came into a village and, uh, with a cooking pot and brought it to this woman's house. It said, here are some bones for you to cook. And when she opened the lid, it was the head of her son inside the pot. Now, this is very difficult for us to understand, not just the cruelty of killing the young man, but to do this to the mother. The desire is, I want you to be crushed. I want you to be destroyed. We might say, yes, but this is a human being. How can you do this? Human life is meaningful. But what, what he's pointing out here is, this is a, that's a nice belief, but it's not true because the value of people can be inflated or diminished. In some countries, they eat dogs. In Western Europe, People tend to pamper their dogs and take a lot of care of them and buy them very nice food. And of course, what this indicates is you don't have solid ground under your feet. We imagine, we believe according to our principles. So when we study, <coughs> excuse me, when we study Buddhism, we come to this formulation he used earlier about the view, the meditation, and so on. So the view we are studying here, the view of emptiness, the view of the non-difference uh, of the two truths. But at this moment, some people are studying the view of the importance of killing Ukrainians, of destroying their uh, fuel supplies so that they will be cold as the winter comes. So, although everything is empty and unborn, with the openness to kindness and compassion, it becomes very important what kind of view we adopt. Then he says, uh, consciousness, that here is meaning uh, our mental capacity to know, this consciousness that truly sees an object is not dependent on the senses. 
the ability to the ability to uh, perceive an object. So the true awareness of the object is that there is no object. The object is a product of objectification. So a true awareness of the object is the inseparability of the object from emptiness. It is an illusory form. It doesn't exist. And this consciousness or clarity is not dependent on the senses. That is to say, our capacity to see the emptiness of everything is not supplied through our senses. Nor, and then he says, nor does it arise from the object. When you go to the cinema and you fall into the film, the film is not, the film is directly showing you its illusion. But you don't want to see the illusion, you believe in it. Often, if you're out with children and they see a rainbow, they become very excited. They're seeing something but they're not seeing anything. Then they go home and they want to draw a rainbow. Now they have these colored lines on the page, that's a rainbow. That's a solidifying representation of an illusion. That is to say, the object itself doesn't show you that it's an illusion. Now, this uh, consciousness or true, true perception does not abide in the middle between subject and object. So <clears throat> both subject and object arise within the arena of uh, this clarity of mind. It's not, the clarity cannot be placed one place or another place. It has no location. So then he says it's not inside nor is it outside. When it arises, it does not come from anywhere. And when it ceases, it does not go anywhere. The clarity which arises when you see something is just, it's not delivered from some other place. It's, uh, it's not something you already have. It is um, arising with the situation and vanishes with the situation. So, for example, if I, if in the lunch break I put something on to cook and uh, I forgot to take it off the stove, then I'm sitting here talking with you. And gradually, my nose is, what's that? Oh, something's burning. So I have to rush to the kitchen. The consciousness of, this, of smell was not very strong when I was just talking with you. The smell and the consciousness of smell arise together. They arise together and they vanish together. And so he says, and so it is said that consciousness, that its arising is empty and its passing is also empty. When I'm conscious of the smell, smelling fills consciousness. When the smell goes away, the consciousness also goes. It's empty when full and empty all the time. That is to say, what we call our consciousness, whether it's our sense consciousnesses or our mental consciousness or the consciousness pervaded by the five afflictions or the universal ground consciousness, these are all without true existence. But when, so linking this back to the first line of this paragraph, when consciousness recognizes that the object is empty of existence, this allows it to awaken to itself being empty of true existence. 
and therefore this uh, ordinary consciousness is not different in that aspect from awareness or rikpa. So he says, quoting the sutras, for one who really sees, no phenomena whatsoever appear. Oh, phenomena, we are, we're used to it. Could be the walls of your flat or something you see looking out the window or looking at the computer. So just as we looked uh, before the break, we have ah, mama, going from sound into word. So when you see that phenomena are like ah, they are a potential, and that what you, what you take them to be is an investment in that potential which solidifies it as something, then by seeing the emptiness of the phenomena, there are no phenomena. All phenomena are imagined. When I imagine phenomena, it is as if they are there. Because, of course, we know I can experience illusory phenomena. I can go to the cinema. I can read a novel. These phen the phenomena there don't exist, and yet, for me, they exist because I can believe in them. So when he's saying, for the person who really sees, um, he's indicating seeing is not the same as imagining. If we truly see, then we see the only thing we can see, which is light. We see patterns of light, which we imagine as entities, as things. Oh. Then he says, the Prajnaparamita, this transcendent wisdom literature says, mentation leads to involvement in the realms of desire, form, and formlessness. So mental activity brings us into birth in different forms, in different realms. Then he says, when there is no mentation, there is no involvement anywhere. Birth take, depends on imagining a context for birth. Mentation or mental activity is becoming. This is what drives the wheel of life. Then he quotes another sutra. When no activity whatsoever is performed, that is known as being at ease. Being at ease is yoga. That is to say, uh, non-duality or non-separation from the ground. Therefore, he says, if ordinary people practice in the state of the absence of phenomena, that is the supreme dharma. And he clarifies this. In the sutra it says, now what is the supreme dharma? It is the absence of the perception of phenomena. So, we need to be clear that the word perception, uh, in Tibetan it's uh, duche, means gathering a knowledge of something. This is not a simple seeing, but the seeing of something. So, the supreme dharma, the supreme path, is not to see things. Now, again, if you think that all the time you see things, and I say you shouldn't see things, then it's as if you, sh you wouldn't see anything at all. We see light, we believe things. The issue is not in the actual, it's in the imagined. So the Prajnaparamita literature says, because what is called enlightenment cannot be perceived as an enlightenment per se or in itself, it is only a name. Buddhahood also cannot be perceived and so is only a name. There is nothing, there is nothing to get. And there's no one who needs to get. We are not a thing with excess or lack. 
So then he says the intrinsic as isness, the the how it isness of all phenomena is like the sky. To be like the sky is to be unborn. So then he says to see that this is never an object of consciousness nor of original knowing is the view. So he's saying whether you look with ordinary dualistic consciousness or whether you look with the original knowing which is the bright mind of the buddha uh, this cannot be seen to abide in this manner without being fixed is the meditation so the, the view is the orientation that says there is nothing to be got so stop grasping to abide in this is to rest in the openness which is free of grasping but we do this without fixation fixation would be that i'm holding myself apart i'm not going to take it i would like it but i'm not going to take it it doesn't mean like that the meditation is to relax into the unborn openness of the mind within which there are no things to be grasped and no grasper this is this is the liberation of all tendency to reify to construct uh, seemingly real and separate entities now this is not a, a state of kind of helpless passivity because he then says to collect manner uh, to collect merit in the manner of an illusion for the sake of sentient beings who are also illusory is the conduct the mind is open and empty yet ceaselessly full of illusory appearance within this field of illusory appearance patterns of manifestation occur linking with other patterns of manifestation and so moving in as illusion with connectivity with all illusion this is the conduct or this is the recommended way of being then he says the vanishing of the notion of illusoriness into spaciousness is the ultimate result. Oh, as long as you have a notion of something, you are, you are interpreting it. Like saying to someone, oh, don't worry about the horror movie, it's just an illusion. So, there the the notion of illusion is being used as an antidote to the belief that the film is depicting something real now if there is no illness you don't need any medicine so when we see that from the very beginning everything is unborn then there's no need to understand things in terms of illusion and just as the formulations of samsara are like clouds vanishing into the sky so the formulations of uh, nirvana or the antidotes also vanish into the sky and with this uh, spaciousness or uninterrupted openness is the ultimate result all-encompassing space that is to say your own open presence within which everything is occurring this is free of interpretation it cannot be caught and interpreted and it doesn't do any interpreting itself it means the spaciousness which is the ultimate result it is beyond speech thought or expression nothing you say or think or feel about it will take you close to it because you are already inseparable from it it is also without a knower who might perceive it as an object of knowledge so you can look at your hand oh 
I know this is my hand. There, the knower and the known are not the same. But this space is like the mirror. It, it shows, but there's no one doing the showing. It's, it's like a kind of magical, incomprehensible, uh, just thisness. And if there is no knower, then it cannot be known. It is self-luminous. So in the Tibetan text, they say Ying Rig Yerme, means uh, the Dharma Datu and uh, Rigpa or awareness are inseparable. It is self-luminous. So he says, regarding the view and meditation of actuality free of entities, view and meditate only as sky to sky. Oh. As we've looked now many times, the sky is always changing, certainly in England. The clouds come and go. The sky is open. Its openness allows the clouds to come and go. The openness of the sky is not blocked by the cloud. From the point of view of duality, <clears throat> I look at the sky from here and the clouds seem to block the sky for me. So he's saying, be careful about this. You are the sky viewing the sky. The mind is open and empty. All experience is open and empty. So the field of potential with the Dharma Dhatu, the sphere within which everything occurs, is undivided, infinite. And so whatever you see is the display of the sky. Sometimes this display looks like subject, sometimes it looks like object. Sky to sky is not something looking at something else. The sky has no boundary. Within this unobstructed openness, phenomena with the uh, formation of subject and phenomena with the formation of object arise, move together, and vanish. So very often you see in the text that uh, it is unborn and unobstructed. The flow of experiences going through the sky like the wind, it's unobstructed. <clears throat> so this is the main meditation instruction. Do the Guru Yoga, relax and release. You have the, the, the eye in front of you, it dissolves, it's open sky. The space is open. The mind is open. The mind is a space. The field is a space, the spaces are inseparable. So then he says, natural meaningfulness, or how it actually is, the original thusness. This is beyond thought and dualistic experience. So the, the implicit message of this is, don't be so bothered about thinking. You cannot think your way out of samsara. But you can think your way into samsara. You don't have to get rid of thoughts, but you have to recognize, I am addicted to thoughts. And so I am not going to pick up thoughts. I cannot ban thoughts. I cannot stop them coming. I cannot turn good thoughts into bad thoughts or bad thoughts into good thoughts. Because as soon as I establish a form, something happens and it changes. Whatever comes, comes. It can come because it is not me, it doesn't define me. It is within me, as me, 
seems to be me, but it is not. You have to experience this again and again and again. The thought that cannot damage or condition the mind, just as the reflection does not damage or condition the mirror. So he's saying it can't be caught by thought. It can't be established as something. It is unborn. But it is not just nothing. Because, because the flow of experience is unimpeded. And so it is beyond evaluation in terms of being or non-being. Nobody's going to pay you to be a Buddhist scholar. We, we don't need this as philosophy. We need this as a shoehorn to ease us back into the here and now where we have always been. Okay, let's take a break a little bit shorter and come back at quarter two. Good. See you then. So now we come to the last section of the text. So <clears throat> it says, when people are not frightened by the profound meaning of emptiness and abide in it with happy devotion, this is explained as being a sign that they have the good fortune to have heard and practiced it previously and will quickly gain enlightenment. So that's uh, good news for some people. If it's, if it's not such good news for you, then what to do? So we need to increase our devotion. Not devotion to someone or something, but devotion as a way of offering uh, an undefended availability in oneself. We are going to die. We have already had many different kinds of experience in our life. None of these experiences have remained. Everything is passing. When things go well, it can be quite enjoyable. We have this rich variety of experiences. <clears throat> but when things don't go so well, then it's more difficult. So we have hopes and fears. We don't know what will happen after death. Dharma says, if you look at your thoughts, you see they seem to be a series of finite moments, and you could imagine them coming to an end. But if you look at your mind itself, and you keep looking and looking, and you see, oh, it's not a thing. This no thing has no beginning and no end. All kinds of experiences arises in it. If you see that the ground is empty, then what comes from the ground is empty. If we see the empty ground, then we see there is no self to uh, interpret or be attacked by what is arising. Things come and go. And yet, somehow, we're here. We're not here as the same person. Since our experience of our body, voice, and mind are always changing. So, this just here-ness with an indeterminate content, or uh, yes, content, is just open. And this doesn't end. For me, certainly, this, the experience of this directly is the certainty that. Uh, there will be many different manifestations when this current one dissolves. Emptiness is fullness, but not filled with something specific, but, but with a ceaseless flow of diversity. In this diversity is connective. So the meaning of our existence is our participation. In modern uh, 
cultures, we don't live in extended families. Many people have quite isolated lives. But that doesn't mean that we are unconnected. When we say, may all beings be happy, may all animals be happy, may all people, all the God realm people, the hell realm people, then we open ourselves to that connection. Keeping ourselves apart, that becomes very restrictive. But being connected is a quality of the mind. Everything is experience. If you live with someone and you see them every day, you have a lot of experience of them. If you see someone once a month or once a year, you experience them less frequently. But in any case, they are your experience. You cannot experience the other as they are. You can only experience your experience of the other. All beings are experienced. All experience is in your mind because your mind is empty. Your ego is not empty. Your ego has friends and grandchildren and wants them to do well. We think especially of these people. They are special for us. For the Buddha, everyone is special. Because the experience of the Buddha is not mediated through the ego. That doesn't mean that it's not warm and friendly. In fact, it's more warm and friendly because it's not mediated through uh, the specifics of what I like and what I don't like. So if we find that we're afraid of death, afraid of emptiness, trying to hold on to our own specific existence, we should investigate again and again, what is the basis for this? Nothing will be resolved by avoiding what is uh, difficult. When we turn towards the difficult experience, we see that actually it is impermanent and arising due to causes and conditions. Oh, he says, actuality, uh, that is to say the, um, the true quality of all phenomena, these, uh, the truth of phenomena is like the sky, ungraspable. You can't catch yourself, you can't catch anything. So again, the message is don't catch, don't grasp. Since, since you were born, the stream of experience has not stopped. Why would you imagine it's going to stop? This is arising and then something else and then something else. The things which arise in the sky are not separate from the sky. You can't say the reflection is the same as the mirror or other than the mirror. What arises in your mind is both your mind and not your mind simultaneously. It's your, it's your mind because it's the experience that's filling your mind. And yet it doesn't define your mind or limit your mind. And so it's not your mind. This is the, the truth or the depth of our presence here, a spaciousness that is beyond thought. To awaken to this is the inexpressible state of original knowing. Original knowing means knowing what, what was there at the origin. What is there at the origin is just openness. As some of us have looked in the Kunzam Monlam, the aspiration of Samantabhadra, the ground is not something which can be found, uncompounded. It is unarisen, it hasn't manifested as anything. 
it is Hongyang. It is uh, without any limit or of extent or depth. It's beyond any kind of formulation. It cannot be expressed. It cannot be placed within either samsara or nirvana. This uh, ground or base or basis or source is your basis and source. When you look to find the thingness of yourself, the de definition of yourself, you don't find anything. This is the door of the spaciousness, which is the ground of everything. Then he says, this is the intrinsic equalness, free of activity and calculation. All reflections are intrinsically equal. Now, when we go to an art gallery, we see some paintings we really like and others we don't find so interesting. This is understandable. But if we apply this same approach to reflections, say, oh, this reflection is really beautiful. I like this. But that other one's very ugly. But what are you comparing and contrasting? The reflections are equal in their emptiness. You cannot take the reflection out of the mirror and weigh it or measure it. You are projecting differential value and meaning. This is your mental activity. So he's saying, you will not experience intrinsic equalness if you insist on creating the self-referential value of everything you encounter. This is the understanding of all the Buddhas of the three times. It means if you don't see it this way, you're in, you're in the wrong team. In the end, the Buddha team always wins. Sentient beings team sometimes in heaven, sometimes in hell. But the Buddhas are always in a beautiful Buddha land with music playing, palm trees swaying. So we want to try to look through the Buddha's eye and see what they see. So he says, absolute thusness is like a barren woman's child. Well, this is a traditional example. If a woman can't have children, then she doesn't have a child. It means to talk of the child of the barren woman is to describe something which doesn't exist. Absolute thusness, the, the deep and final intrinsic truth of everything is not to be found. So he says, there is nothing concrete, nothing to think about in this ordinary original state. It means there's uh, nothing to work out, nothing to make sense of. It is as it is. We live in a world that is full of opinions. President Trump very kindly uh, emphasized the existence of fake news. The ego is addicted to fake news. Like the late president, it's plugged into Twitter day and night. The ego wants something to be happening. But there's nothing to think about in this calm, open, immediately filling and emptying spaciousness. Relative subject and object are merged as illusion and can be used without acceptance, rejection, or desire. That is uh, to say, subject and object are co-emergent. They arise together as illusory forms. We need to remember that the polarity of reality and fantasy is not what is being discussed here. <clears throat> Illusion means appearance without any internal 
self-definition or self-existence. Subject is like this and object is like this. Who you take yourself to be is, as we have looked, arising from many different factors. And all you encounter is also arising on the basis of many different factors. <clears throat> because there is no independent basis to the subject or the object, they are merged as illusion. They are not two separate things. And this is the key point and can be used without acceptance, rejection or desire. Usually we use things according to our intention. So in karmic formation, the, the ground is duality, the intention is uh, towards the object from the subject. And then we engage in activity and process the result. And this generates the karma or the impulses which generate the patterning of different forms of life. But if we allow these forms to arise, here particularly he's talking about meditation, we see movement in the space of the mind. The energy of the mind, the potential of the mind sometimes looks like the subject, sometimes like the object. The mind is open and empty. As such, it doesn't move. And yet, in a kind of magical way, movement is ceaseless. Just as the mirror doesn't do anything to make reflections. In a seemingly magical way, reflections arise in the mirror. So without acceptance, without involvement in an appropriative way, without rejection, without a, an impulse to uh, get rid of the object, and without desire, meaning with, even without desire to benefit sentient beings, the benefit of all arises. So this is the practice of the Buddha's understanding. The Buddhas benefit all beings in the manner of a dream. The Buddha is free of existence and non-existence, and the Buddha see that all sentient beings are free of existence and non-existence. They have no desire to help them. Because the desire would start to be a distortion on the openness of the field. But as a reflection arises in the mirror, so the compassion of the Buddha shows. In the traditional example, on a full moon night, you can see the reflection of the moon in a, in a pond. But it's not just happening in your pond. The moon is being reflected in thousands, millions of ponds. Without doing anything, the moon appears in these ponds. So in that way, the compassion of the Buddha flows out. So on a relative level, you can explore this when you're talking with a friend and the conversation goes easily and you're just enjoying their company, everything you talk about is kind of equal. You're not desperate to talk about your health or their relationship. There is an easy flow. So oh, that gives you some flavor, hopefully, of what this is like. So it's, uh, this is the practice of the Buddha's understanding, which essentially means this is how the Buddha's understanding manifests without effort. Then he says, <clears throat> until your mind gains the power of this understanding, you should avoid attachment to all forms of wealth and possessions. 
Then he goes on to say, remain in the mountains like a wild deer and abide on the path without deviation or backsliding. So this uh, second sentence is more challenging for us. We are not likely to live up in the mountains. Our, the conditions of the cultures in which we live make that very difficult. So if we can't do external renunciation, then we go back to the first sentence. He says, you should avoid attachment to all forms of wealth and possessions. Yeah. So in that way, you can be a visitor in your own life. These are not my possessions. These are things I use. When I die, they will be used by other people. You can have a relationship of functionality without a sense of identification or investment or attachment. If you find that you are very attached to something, you can think about giving it away. Because if you uh, build your life on this seemingly reliable object, it will deceive you. In the Bible, it says you shouldn't build your uh, house on sand. But Buddhists being somewhat perverse, say, oh, no, please build your house on sand. Everything is impermanent. Stay with the sand. If you have one of these little and timing things for checking and boiling an egg. They're very useful. Sand is pouring away. The morning is gone. Yesterday is gone. We're almost at the end of our Zoom time together. Vanishing, vanishing. We flow together, we participate together. This moment of connectivity is here and then dissolved. There is nothing solid to build on, and we also are not solid. The sand, you watch it going through this little hole as it falls from one half to the lower half. It's not nothing at all, and it's not a fixed something. So, all the possessions you have are with you for a while. Even if you have them, you don't see them every minute of every day. When you engage with them, new experiences arise. So you can investigate for yourself, what is the meaning of possession? It is a conventional type term. Some possessions increase in value. You, if you buy a, a painting and it's a good painting, it will probably increase in value through time. And if you buy a new car, you immediately encounter depreciation. Value is situational, not intrinsic. So he says, towards all outer and inner situations, be they agreeable or disagreeable, be without happiness or sorrow, desire or aversion the greatest the greatest friend on the path is to have the support of unborn presence i'm saying an attitude of equalness to everything will maintain your openness to each moment siya lama used to say there is no virtue in the family if you are looking after your old parents or looking after children or grandchildren, this is the nature of family. It's not virtue. Virtue begins with the stranger because it's a free gift. You have no obligation and you don't have a disposition to help or harm them. So if you open to it, you have a simple contact. No agenda, just an availability. And this can be maintained in all directions. There's no predisposition. 
soul to, to practice this approach of warm, hospitable evenness, uh, the greatest friend you can have is unborn presence. Unborn presence means free of egoic identity. Your name is a conventional term. I remember when I was in primary school, in my class, uh, there was a boy who had the audacity to be called James. But I am James. So when the teacher said James, I'm looking up, he is looking up, but I am James. My name is a conventional name. It seems to be addressed to me, but it's shared with many, many other people. The ego wants to be special. Awareness sees, oh yes, we have many different names. With Padmasambhava, we have the eight names or the eight forms of Padmasambhava. We all have different meanings and values for different people. So unborn presence is the presence which has not been born into a specific formulation of identity, or a specific uh, sense, uh, set of functions. So <clears throat> now he gives you again a summary. Wisdom is to experience that your mind is like the sky. Compassion is to not abandon illusory sentient beings. Means to be available, not, not to be preoccupied. So whenever we find ourselves in a particular mood, maybe a bit bored or lonely or full of self-pity, we are functionally less available. It, from the point of view of wisdom, we don't need to do anything. We see the illusory nature of what is arising in our mind. That is to say, we are allowing the, the proposition or the construction to deconstruct itself, to empty itself out from within. In that way, we remain available no matter what's arising. There is always space. It's not a limited commodity. The ego gets overwhelmed and filled up, but awareness doesn't. So he says, by acting in accordance with the view incorporating their union, that's the union of wisdom and compassion, one will quickly gain the great original knowing that does not rest anywhere. Many, many things rest on our ego. When you go shopping, what you see, what you attend to and what you purchase depends on you, what you like, what you can afford and so on. But the profound clarity of emptiness doesn't rest on anything. So then it's quoting this uh, Nirvana Sutra. Emptiness is not to perceive emptiness or not emptiness. We'd say. Emptiness is non-conceptual, it's not resting on any idea of empty or not empty. The self-expression of emptiness appears everywhere. The self-expression of emptiness is the Dharma Dhatu. The Dharma Dhatu is not a thing. It is what occurs here and now. Here and now has no limit, it doesn't exclude. It just is, always, 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 just this, just this. So the self-expression of emptiness appears everywhere and everywhere is always here and now. And having appeared, it becomes empty and so appearance and emptiness are in union. It only appears to become empty. You look at the sea, a wave arises from the sea. 
this wave goes back into the sea. It was never other than the sea. This is the truth about all experience. One can only realize this within oneself and nowhere else. And so emptiness is said to be the realm of original knowing of one's own awareness, which sees everything clearly means it's not an idea, it's not something to know about, it arises for you, as you, the openness of your own basic presence. It was always there. For example, if you have a difficult posture and you're a bit bent over and you go to see a body worker, and they tell you to imagine you have a string coming out the top of your head. This is supporting you. Let your weight rest down through your spine. You have come to a balanced posture. This balance was always there as your potential. The body worker hasn't given it to you. It was there. It's yours but you couldn't find it. So this is the nature of the teaching. Nobody can give you anything. The Dharma teacher shows you how you stray from yourself. If you see that you lean over one way, then, oh, you straighten up. That's all. Now, if you are used to having a bad posture, being off balance seems normal and sitting up straight seems abnormal so the muscles have a tendency to take you back off balance but when you're balanced then the muscles relax you're not maintaining tension and so you can respond in all directions to respond, yeah, you, it's easy to go in any direction. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's the sense of this, that there is nowhere else to realize this but in yourself or to awaken to it within yourself. Because my mind is intrinsically empty, there is no uh, blocking content which allows the freshness of the original knowing which sees everything clearly. Then he quotes the great Magic Lovely. If there is no mentation whatsoever, then errancy will never arise. It means your own thoughts lead you astray. When you go seeking for your mind, you lose your mind. She says, destroy discriminating perception. This is truly different from that. This is better than that. As we looked before, you can have discernment. You can have the very precise sense of the difference of patterning but don't attribute a true existence to these patterns. So then she gives us some advice for the meditation practice. And this is very useful. You can copy it out for yourself and keep it close to you because it's very precious. Mind is free of duality. So look as if there were nothing really there to look at. This means adopt a panoramic view relax your eyes out from the side space for everything when you focus very strongly on one thing then it's as if that uh, is going to it pulls you into a figure ground differentiation your mind is not a thing it's not an object so she says, if you look too strongly, then you will not see your own mind. 
you have to find out for yourself. Nobody can do this for you. You find out, well, how do I look without looking for something? You have to be open and available. You're not a hunter. You're just appreciating. So, but if you do that, or even if you see a little, you will not experience how the mind itself is. So don't have even a speck of real object to look at. So you're, we are all very familiar with deceiving ourselves by considering our ego self, by talking about ourselves as if we were something. That is to say, although the mind is not an object, our ego self, which most of the time stands in the place of the mind, announcing itself as the doer, the thinker, the feeler, this uh, ego self has accustomed us to the notion that there is a doer of the deed. So then we have what are called the, the three wheels, the looker, the looked at, and the looking. And these three wheels turn together and keep the, the machine or the construction of our own ego identity in a reified world, it keeps it in place. So we have to look without being a looker. We do this by relaxing, by opening. The mind has not gone unconscious, but it's not intentionally selecting. And then if we sit like that, without prejudice, we find, we find that what is revealed is the openness, the unborn presence of everything. So then Pato Rinpoche concludes, the pure as it isness of mind itself is emptiness and clarity, the state free of reification. So another word for clarity could be uh, luminosity or experience. It is simple occurrence or pure occurrence, which is not the occurrence of something. So being present and open, there is experience, but it's ungraspable and we don't need to grasp. With the arising of awareness. Awareness is not arising, awareness is always there. We are opening ourselves to what is. For us, it is as if awareness is arising, like the dawn is rising into the sky. The sun has always been in the sky. It's not coming into the sky. We just haven't been where the sun was. Now, if we relax out of our dualistic conceptualization, we are where the sun is shining. So this is the openness of the mind, which cannot be interpreted and doesn't do interpretation. It's, it is, has no dualistic perception. So we sit in the practice like this. You sit as often as you can, different try for yourself, different periods for sitting, because you're having to work with your own circumstances. So then it's time to get up from sitting. This could be a feeling if you have plenty of free time, or it could be an alarm clock ringing if you have to get to work. The key thing is not to make a, a hiatus, a tear, a disruption, but to allow appearances to arise uh, illus in the illusory manner of a dream. Your body is an experience. Your body has no existence as an entity. So you put on your jacket one arm in after the other, you and the jacket are moving together. So same with everything you do. You check with your money, you go to the door, you check your keys. 
There is no need to reify this experience. You, this form is an arising of a flow of experience. The door is an experience. The stairs are an experience. Experience is moving in a field of experience. So for months and years, practice the relaxed state of clarity and emptiness which is the inseparability or union of meditative balance and subsequent achievement. When you're sitting in your practice, you have experience which is empty. When you get up, move in the world, speak with other people, you have experience and emptiness. If you see that all experience is present, showing, manifest, but ungraspable, then you see the non-duality of the uh, meditative balance of sitting practice and the subsequent uh, achievement of being in the world. So, <clears throat> now we come to the end. We covered a lot, it's quite a dense text. It's something worth visiting again and again. It's talking about us. It's talking about how we are. We're not being asked to become artificial or to pretend anything. We're being invited to stop pretending. And <clears throat> this we can do in any situation at any time. So. Only we can decide to do this or not. Most Buddhists have quite a few Buddhist books. Buddhist books don't do anything. The meaning of the Buddhist book is revealed in the moment of reading a line. Then the next line and the next line. With a text like this, you can take one line and stay with it for a week. Take just one word, illusion. Do we really, really have a deep felt sense of what this means? Well, you can return to this and inquire because if everything is illusion and you don't know what it is, that's bad news. So, dear friends, we come to the end. Um, I want to thank Pedro for keeping all the computer things going. It's a great help that we don't have to worry about that. And uh, to thank our translators, uh, Kati, Juan, Milton and Zhao, and Bartek. And uh, thanks to you all for your attention and interest. Hopefully this can be useful to us. And we have a few uh, more dates arranged for this year, and the dates for next year will appear sometime soonish. Oh, bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.